Hello, and welcome back to the virtual Engadget stage for CES 2021. Um, okay, we're winding down things. This is, we're nearing the end of our CES programming. Um, and I would love to talk about something really fun. Uh, so we're gonna talk about Microsoft Flight Simulator. Uh, with me today, I have Jorg Newman, head of Microsoft Flight Simulator, and Sebastian Wolock, co-founder and CEO of Asobo Studio. Welcome, both of you. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having Hi. us. Super excited to be here. So I don't know if you guys uh, know this, but I sat in on a handful, I mean, probably three or four uh, preview and review sessions for the media uh, leading up to the launch of Microsoft Flight Simulator. So I know like how passionate you guys are like, about this franchise. You guys are very invested. Um, so just to start things off, I'd love to hear your personal history uh, with the franchise and then describe the sim in your own words. Let's, uh, let's start with Jorg. Yeah, I mean, I, I was a player um, back in the day. I always look behind me. I think I started with this one. So in, back in 1995 on my Pentium 60, <laughs> um, that's how I started. It was always a fascinating piece of software. It obviously had, it had pre, it, it started in 82. And even before that, uh, there were some releases. And it's, it's always stood for something. It was always about realism and accuracy and pushing the power of what a PC could do at its time. So when I entered the when I entered it in '95, it was it was the first time it it, it had a full representation of Earth, but it was super simple, right? Like Chicago was like a you know a few little a few little uh, rectangles, um, but but back in the day it was amazing, and uh, it always stood there with me. And um, so as a player, I've been there for a long time, and then um, you know over the years I've been at Microsoft for for, for quite a long time. Uh, we always looked at how can we bring this back. You know, when should we bring it back? Because we hadn't done one in, in a number of years since 2007 or so. Um, and it was always like, we need to take it forward with meaningful innovations. And um, I think we this the time had come. So that's when we started back in 2015, 16, when we started talking about this. But maybe enough, we talk about this more in a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and Sebastian, what about you? Um, yeah, I think... Uh, Flight Simulator was the very first thing I ever saw on 3D on a PC when I was a kid. And it was a very important part of what brought me into actually programming and, and software development, etc. So it, it was very important to me. Awesome. All right. So so Flight Simulator, like like you mentioned, uh, Jorg, you said it's the whole world. At one point in 95, you guys had, or Flight Simulator had, rendered the whole world, but it wasn't really the whole world, not in the way where you could really explore specific cities and recognize those cities necessarily. Um, I mean, this this franchise has been around for what, 38 years? I gotta say that's older than me, so <laughs> good job. Um, but this is the first time, the, the new version is the first time the whole planet is now explorable, like in real time with with live weather uh, and these, these really, just really impressive uh, things. So I, I wonder if you could talk about the technological advancements that have brought us to this point where real-time weather and Earth simulation is possible. Yeah, I think it's a few things that came together, really. Um, it was one of the things that's happening all the time is that the planet is getting scanned and it's not like we have cameras everywhere. I always joke that we have cameras in our cars and our front doors, certainly on our phones. But uh, more importantly for, for this topic, there's satellites, there's over 2000 satellites circling the earth and there's tons of planes, often with special cameras that are basically photographing the earth in 3D. Uh, so that's a fairly recent thing. It's a gigantic amount of data. In our case, it's over two petabytes, now actually creeping up to two and a half petabytes. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just a massive amount of work, so, so uh, amount of data. So the first thing you have is the scanning in it by itself, but it's also you need to store that. And so at, at Microsoft, we have a tech stack that is really perfectly suited for this. It, we have Azure, where we can store massive amounts of data. We have Bing Maps, which is essentially a, a globe in it by itself. They use all the satellite imagery and also orth uh, graphic data that we get and basically already created a kind of a, a 2D model of the Earth, if you will. Um, and then ultimately you need to get it to the end consumer, which means you need to stream it. Because it's so much, when you think about two and a half petabyte, it's it's something like two million, two million DVDs or something crazy. Like, so it's, it, you could never put this in a box or anything like that. So I think the advent of uh, the cloud, um, 
Azure with storage, Azure, Azure data centers across the planet that allows us to get it at, at low um, latency to end consumers. That was sort of the beginning point where we said, you know, maybe this is the time where it's possible because the, the dream actually to fly around the planet and to look outside and it looks exactly like Earth, that, that dream has been with the franchise since the beginning. It was just technically not possible. And I think the this convergence of technologies now made this possible. Mm -hmm. Sebastian, anything to add? What, like how Asobo helped kind of make this possible? What kind of technology you guys were really interested in? Um, yeah, so I think, uh, as Jörg said, the, the streaming and also the um, reconstructing the whole um, elements, you, you get thousands of little pieces and then on the end consumer computer, you, you, you need to bring it uh, back together into one piece of puzzle. Um, um, it's, it's, yeah, what we contributed a lot with and, and also optimizing the whole process because the user is always moving forward and, uh, and basically you need to erase what is behind you and load in what is in front of you, constantly streaming um, environments. It's like the, um, I mean, computer games have done this in the past when you stream pieces of levels in front of you and, and unload stuff behind you. Um, but this is just the entire planet and you can go any direction up, down, uh, closer to the ground. And so um, there is a lot of stuff happening in parallel and, and, and modern computers have really helped uh, allow this by having multiple CPUs and, and even graphics cards, which can do work in the background. And that mm -hmm. gives us, just to jump in, that gives us what I call sort of the static world. The static world is basically uh, the photography, the imagery, then Bing also has something that's called photogrammetry. Um, basically, it's 400 cities that are in full 3D. Basically, it's a plane flying overhead at pretty low altitude, taking a picture every second. You construct a point cloud, and it gives you essentially a 3D picture of, of, of cities that are highly, highly accurate, down to like seven centimeters or something like that. Incredible. Mm -hmm. But that only gives you, you know, frankly, 2% or so, like not even of the planet's surface. So we had like 98% that we had no 3D data uh, for. And that, that basically, um, we, but the other thing that essentially now becomes more and more available is um, creating procedural worlds with machine learning. There was a whole nother thread. So we started with what I call the static world that I just said, but then we wanted to fill in all the other places, all the other cities that we didn't have photogrammetry for. And then you basically need to start to become clever. You start to look at the, um, the imagery that we have stored in Azure and run machine learning algorithms on them, essentially to find things like building outlines, which you will you train up the algorithm. It finds the outline, it basically predicts how, how tall the building is, and then we procedurally construct these buildings. And in, in FlightSim, uh, we, we always say we build the world every 72 hours. Um, we, have, we actually plant about two trillion trees um, and create over almost like two billion buildings procedurally. Uh, it was, it's just a fascinating process, and it gets better all the time, right? Machine learning is such that it always gets smarter. You always learn more. So um, it's, been, it's an evolution. Even since launch, we launched in August, it's better now, and it will continue to get better. As we get better, newer data, and we run better and, and more and smarter algorithms, the, the world representation becomes more and more accurate. And so I call that sort of the procedural world. And then on top of that, as you said at the intro, it, the, the world's not static, right? The world has, a, you know, 365 days right now where I live. It's winter. Um, you know, there's weather, there's seasons. And we, we partnered with another company of experts, uh, in this case, Media Blue in Switzerland. They have a 3D prediction model of weather uh, across the entire planet. They take in a bunch of data stations from all over the place and on top of that have a prediction model and they feed that into our simulation. So that's when you get real-time weather, just recently we introduced real-time snow and real-time you know, frozen lakes and ice and those types of things. And that's also an evolution that will keep going. As we get more and more data stations, we're gonna feed that into the sim and the atmospheric, the atmospheric simulation will get better. And that's, there's more beyond that, as you can imagine, right? The world is you know, complex. We're, we're currently looking at some things with water, like just how can we get that more, more accurate? So it's a, we're on this journey really to get the planet as accurate as you can possibly make it, sort of as a digital twin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, there's what, like 117 million lakes on the planet. They're also in this game. You know, facts like that, those numbers are staggering. This is something it feels like would not be possible to program by hand, right? Like it <laughs> feels like machine learning AI is is doing a lot of heavy lifting here. Would you say that's that's fair? 
Oh, it's totally fair. Seth, yeah. do you want to yeah. talk a little bit more? Yeah, machine learning and also modern GPUs. Like, uh, I mean, we we just looked into the lake uh, lakes today, right? It's it's uh, there is just so many um, that um, um, there is thousands of bitmaps which have uh, like they call it um, distance fields. So you don't even like basically it's a, it's a description in a bitmap where you you have the borders and depths of the of the lakes and rivers, and and this allows you to achieve extreme complexity. Um, you can have thousands of of lakes in in one little area. Um, and it makes it it makes it super fast for for the GPU to process, um, um, and, and this is really possible because we now have I mean we can write uh, huge shaders and 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 do a lot of things on the on the GPU that was not possible 10 or 20 years ago. It it would have been all geometry and and very very limited in and the number of things you can just uh, handle. Mm -hmm. And I mean on top of like recreating the planet, adding live weather, all these live features. There's also just the amount of like points that you have to simulate on the plane itself, right? Like there, it's so dense with with little things that can just really tilt the entire plane and change your whole course. Like, what what are some of the features? If you can run through a handful of features that you have to be aware of at all times when you're programming a game like this, like atmosphere uh, or or wind or anything like that, yeah. Yeah, this, this is something we 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 found out, uh, and that I mean personally, it shocked me the first time I flew a real aircraft. Um, so we we decided that we had to jump on aircraft. So we, we hired a lot of pilots um, with experience, but also we we thought that um, the key members of the project needed to experience flying, and and flying an aircraft by themselves. And on the very first flight, um, um, the the thing that shocked me the most is how the plane floats in the air. And it's part of the environment. Um, you, you feel, um, especially on hot uh, summer days, and, and the first time I, I flew was on a, on a it, I think it was in June, so um, it was very hot. And you feel the updrafts, you feel the forest, you, 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 can, you could close your eyes and feel what is below you because the, the ground, uh, because it catches temperature from the sun and uh, uh, blocks or doesn't block wind, um, it changes the atmosphere and the plane is extremely uh, connected to that atmosphere. And, and uh, that's something we implemented in the simulation by simulating the airflow in the world um, very accurately. Um, and also, yeah, increasing, as you said, the number of points that are simulated. So that, for example, if the, if the right wing touches an updraft, um, but the left wing doesn't, it creates a roll motion. And so this makes it feel extremely connected and, and realistic, just like a, a real plane uh, in the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe just to compare, for comparison's sake, an FSX, like our the last um, the last iteration of the franchise back in 2007, we had one control point on the plane. So basically, there was one point. They, all the physics were operating on that one point, and I believe now it's what 1300 Seb. <laughs> so the wow. entire the, the wing the wings like every single thing turbulence is micro turbulence is all that is calculated all the time, and uh, yeah, and you have to be fully aware of things like. The temperature, the dew point, like everything in the atmosphere matters clearly to the plane because it's physically as accurate as you can really make it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and honestly, when I'm playing this game, it's it's not that it like it doesn't take no concentration, it doesn't take no effort. It's like this perfect balance of you have to be aware of what you're doing at all times, but you don't always have to be fiddling with the joysticks or anything. You don't always have to be um, like actively engaged in the game, but you have to be watching all the time. You have to be watching your gauges, you have to be watching your plane itself, and just kind of feeling whether you're on the right track or whether you're gonna flip or anything. Um, and that's, I think that would be really hard to, yeah, to put into a video game and, uh, and the simulation does it well. Like you even have VFR, you have visual flight rules. Like was that, that was a pretty important thing for you guys to nail in this game, right? It was yeah, actually, absolutely. yeah. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, sorry, uh, VFR, yeah. Um, so so just to define what VFR is, so visual flight rules, it means that you don't have to have, a, so you have to ground in, in view at all times. Um, you don't have to have as many instruments. So for example, instruments which help you fly the aircraft inside of a cloud, so where you don't see the ground anymore and you don't even know if you're flying upside down or, 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 or normally. And so you see the ground at all times. Um, and you use the ground as a reference to know where you are, to find your way back to your airport or to navigate. And so um, it means that you are above 500 feet, so very close to the ground, but not usually don't go very high, right? It's between 500 feet and usually 10,000 feet. 
Um, the higher you go, the more you can see the terrain, but it's really the terrain that is important. And that is a big improvement um, on this iteration of Flight Simulator, is that the terrain being, the whole world being stored on Azure and streamed to the user, you get the real world terrain. It, it looks very close to reality, and, and it has exactly the same features. It has the same buildings, the same lakes, roads, and um, I mean, every flight I prepare, I always do it in the sim first. And, and it helps me um, know that there's this village, which looks like that. And then I have to turn left. And then there's a highway to follow. Um, it's, it's exactly the same. Now, as the, as the series, like obviously the series, as you said, is almost, almost four decades old. So it's gathered a unique and incredibly loyal community called Flight Simmers. And um, before we ever really started coding anything, we, we, we listened to them. We asked them questions, what are they looking for? And there was a lot of the things were like what you would expect. Hey, a modern looking game engine, something that takes advantage of modern hardware. But the thing that was the standout and somewhat was surprising is they said, please, please enable worldwide VFR. That's never been possible. It's not even possible in the really large level D simulators that the actual airliners are using to train their pilots. So it's truly a, a first that we were able to achieve. And so it's it's fascinating. We get lots of feedback. The, the, the knock-on effect is that people now send us lots of videos from all over the planet, and they show us side by side of what the world looks like, where they live, and then how it looks in the flight sim. Oftentimes, it's very, very, very similar. And sometimes there's nuance where they said, hey, you know, this is not quite right. And then we go and address that and try to try to get it to match as precisely as we can. Yeah, and so I, I actually want to build off of that little story there. Um, I wonder if you've seen like any really cool or just kind of surprising things that players have been doing with the sim. Like I saw a game developer I follow, Rami Ismail. He was tracking his own flight in real time on the plane and then playing in flight sim, and it was just it was like. Perfect. It was honestly a few seconds off or something. Maybe his flight landed like a few seconds before uh, the flight sim flight. But like, what have you seen other stuff like that? Just cool stories. Yeah, I get. I mean, honestly, there's there's quite a few videos like this um, uh, where people fly. They, I get them every day. There's videos of somebody saying, "Hey, I just flew over Vancouver, and the weather, like the, the clouds were perfect." Uh, and then there's like a tower that has a red light and it's not blinking. And so they basically give me a bug report of the real world towards our sim. Uh, sometimes people send us send us images that I think the sim looks better than the real world. So that, and, and and what's fascinating is you know the the we we actually calculated this at some point if we really wanted to look at every place on Earth, like we said if we're in a Cessna and we fly five thousand feet or something and look outside, I think it would take forty years. Uh, so we can't really see every place. And it, it, it is this um, the community that we have and the, the passion that they have to get this right helps us a lot. So people um, in different areas are now engaging, really, uh, to make the sim better, airports better, or just the, the overall terrain um, via these videos. So I think that's it's been, it's been an amazing journey with the community together. Mm -hmm. And anything else? Yeah, I, so, I, mean, I really, oh, yeah. I really love the when people share like the world map, and then they have a, a like a, some people are doing a round the world tour, going down yeah. South America, back up over over Alaska, and and that's really really awesome. Like it takes them several weeks to to do a mm -hmm. around the world tour. I, I, I think this is this is particularly interesting. We had some bugs. I don't know if you saw that. There was a bug early on in uh, in Melbourne. There were, so it was a typo. Basically, somebody had made a skyscraper and just basically and, and, and entered the wrong number. So the thing was like endlessly tall. And then people actually landed on that crazy. So we actually ended up watching all these videos. And just recently, I saw a video. Somebody took a, seven, uh, a 787 and landed it in Lukla, uh, which is like in the Himalayas. It's not meant for this flight, but they somehow managed it. And that, that that it's so fun, you know. People are people are really trying things that in the real world might be just a little scary, you know. And they're trying it in the flight sim because it is so accurate. And we see things that we we thought we'd never see, like the, that 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 runway. It, it's this steep. It's really short, but they managed it despite the physics being accurate. So it's super cool. I love that. I know we've covered a few of the bugs that have popped up. You know, we've covered the the actual updates to the game as well, but we also covered a few of the bugs just because they're fun. Like it's. It's it, it kind of speaks to the heart of the game where you just get to treat the planet as a playground 
And uh, so seeing like a really tall skyscraper where there's not supposed to be one, it's pretty funny. You, it's just kind of joyful. See the, did you see the gigantic hole in Brazil? No, I <laughs> so didn't was, see the hole. It was literally going down to the center of the earth. Um, so oh, it was some, so it was some out of the data provider we have for our airports, there was a bug, that the number was at zero. So it literally went down to the zero point of the planet. And people found that. It's literally in the middle of Brazil somewhere. I don't know exactly where it was, but it was amazing. I actually flew into it. <laughs> oh my God. But but Why there's not? a different type of discovery, but it was cool. Exactly, yeah. And actually um, earlier you mentioned that like um, actual training programs for pilots don't even have the level of detail that flight sim does do you think there's an application where this will maybe replace or help pilots uh in training scenarios actually learn how to fly there's quite a bit going on i mean honestly we we, we work very closely with the aircraft manufacturer simply because we're trying to get the planes as accurate as possible it's very fruitful relationship and they they look at our software and they see something that's new for them uh, and there, there's quite a few discussions about these things. Nothing, nothing firm yet. But I, how about this? I wouldn't be surprised if there, if there were something. Yeah, you. I mean, you guys are constantly updating the game, and I know you have a pretty ambitious DLC schedule as well. Um, so, like, what kind of what kind of things are you most looking forward to? I guess in this game, or, like, are people clamoring for something, um, or are you personally interested in in an update? I mean, I would say it this way, like I cannot overstate how important it is to have this flight sim community. They're really super knowledgeable, super gracious with their time. And they they have been in this in the simming hobby for decades. So they know a ton. And we we actually actively collect their feedback. Every week we publish their their priorities. And a lot of what we do has to do with their priorities. When they say, hey, you know, we would really like X, like for example, right now they want us to uh, make an editor so they can help us get the airports even more accurate, like enable people to do some editing themselves and then upload it to our servers. And we listen to that and we're working on that. And I think this, that, that's a, it's a wonderful thing. You know, I've been making games for 25 years. I've never had that, that there's passionate, knowledgeable people basically in some ways telling you really with passionate knowledge what they want and you just sit there and it's like, okay, well, that's what we need to do. And I think you see, like, in, we, the way we structure our updates is we have um, basically world updates, and that is, it's super cool in my opinion. Like, we basically go into areas of the world, find even better data than we had at launch, make that really nice, create some experiences around it, build some airports and those types of things. And and with that, like, the first one we ever did was in Japan. It's not a natural simming environment. You know, there's not that many private pilots in Japan. But boy, were there many people flying in Japan, probably for the first time. Because and, and so we can highlight all this beautiful planet that we have. We can highlight different sections with these updates. And those we plan ahead, roughly, I mean, we're, I'm, I just started working on the 2022 plan. So the, the plan for that for 2021 is pretty, pretty well in place. But other things like the what we call simulation updates, we keep that fairly flexible because we want to have this interaction and we want to have bandwidth to actually do things that the, the audience tells us, the community tells us what they need. Mm -hmm. And we do that every month. Like every month there's a big update. It'll never yeah. end. Great. <laughs> well, that's the plan, right? What about you, Sebastian? Anything you're looking forward to in the update? Um. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward on to um, many of the sim updates that are coming, and some. So many of the, I would say, short-term updates are, are, as York says, answers to the community's requests, and and some of them are are, are looking forward to. Um, um, so it's 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 mostly, I mean, little bug fixes, improvements, um, many improvements for aircraft creators. So um, there's there's things which have been requested that we've implemented that are coming. So I'm looking forward to this, um, especially because it's going to enable um, more and more different types of planes um, to be added to the to the to the sim um, by by third party and and modders and and people who who help make the 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 sim better. Um, so that I'm, I'm particularly looking forward to these uh, improvements to the to the tools, um, and also um, things that we improve on the on the aircraft um, coming in the in the future is is ways for um, users to um, change the aircraft a little bit. So um, um, for example, right now if you choose the one one fifty two, it's always the same, right? It's the one fifty two, but in the real world, 
um, no 152 is exactly the same than, than another, right? They're all um, a little bit more used. I mean, when I go to, to, to our airport, some, some of the planes have, a, have even scotch taped um, wings because they hit a bird and, and some have the paint which is more used or whatever, right? It's, it's there's little tiny differences um, and they may impact the drag coefficient a little bit. Um, for example, that's why uh, something very specific, every plane has this little certificate where they weigh it. You know, it goes on a scale and it's very precise, right? And, and they do that on every plane because every plane is a little bit different. No plane can be like out of a factory and have exactly the same. Just because maybe one has a GPS of one brand and one another has different equipment, every chain, everything changes. And, and this really changes the way the aircraft flies. Um, and these are little little things that we are going to add in the future that allow users to um, um, customize or personalize or, or change the aircraft a little bit um, to get a different experience or to make it match maybe a, a specific plane they're they're trying to to simulate uh, that they know in the real life or, or something something like that. Um, th I'm looking forward to that as well. That yeah, maybe that's one, one more comment is this, that, that that we have this that we don't have just a community a community of of simmers, we also have a community of creators. And it's frankly, it's been blowing us away what they've done already. So we, we, I think we launched roughly five months ago. They've almost made a thousand add-ons. And it's just amazing. Like it's, 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 when I get up in the morning, I actually check out what they do because it's like a candy store. Like there's new airports popping up everywhere. And those are people that are live there locally so they can get the airport perfectly right. And then there's more and more aircraft. People make missions. There's some group that made like an MMO on top of our sim. And it's a, it's a sandbox, right? And in, in, in many ways, people can contribute. And that's so much of the energy will come out of that. And I, I, I love that. It's great. Well, that actually uh, feeds into a question that I had personally. Um, so in the game or in the sim, there are some areas of the globe that you can you can really dive into, and they're extra detailed. They're like super accurate because uh, because you have the information to create them in that way. Um, but then there are areas of the globe that aren't as as accessible in that way. You have some areas like similar with the Google Maps Street View or or these Street View things, where just parts of the globe are not as covered as others. The Western world is more covered than say the entire continent of Africa. Um, so are you like, what kind of efforts are you taking to like better feature areas of the globe that aren't as covered by being maps or, or photogrammetry? It's, it's a, it's a deep passion of me, of mine personally. And, and I mean, just this morning, just to tell you a story, what happens is people that, as I said at the beginning, that the world is getting scanned and lots of people do this locally. Like for example, for the England update that is coming out in about a week, uh, we worked with a British company, uh, called blue sky that made. 3D photogrammetry cities because we really wanted London. It's really important to have it, and they had it. And um, I get ping from companies in in Israel and Australia and South Korea, and I think they already the data already exists. It's just never been served up to a community to actually, you know, be consumable. Uh, and I think we are a wonderful vessel for this type of thing. And 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 my passion is to get the entire planet right. So when we talk about world updates, it's literally going to travel around the planet. You know, every every two or three months, we're going to have a new update of a of a area that has that has not been served all that well. And I'm I'm super excited. Can't really talk about exactly what they are yet, uh, but there's some areas that have never really been good, and we're going to have some really great things to show for those, both in 2021 and beyond. So it's just this continued improvement of the planet. Awesome. Anything to add, Sebastian? All good. No. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, all right. You know, I think that's going to do it for us. Thank you both for being here with us. Uh, we had a great conversation. Um, and I'll probably be playing some flight simulator soon. It calms me down. It's a very calming experience. Meditative is what I called it in my review. So thank you. Um, thank you so much. And, you know, after thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And then after this, we're going to have more on the Engadget stage at CES. We're going to talk about weird concepts and how they make it to market. And then eventually we'll have the best of CES awards tonight.
Good afternoon and welcome back to Engadget's continuing coverage of the completely online, totally virtual CES 2021. I just wanted to say, you know, I feel like I've spent the last few days and weeks of my life the same way a lot of my industry colleagues have spent the last few days and weeks of their lives. They are meeting companies, taking uh, announcements down, learning about new products, writing about new products when applicable, and maybe most important, making sure those stories go up at just the right time. And it honestly can be a bit of a drag, but every once in a while, you're lucky enough to come across an announcement or take a meeting about something that's just off the beaten path in ways that just really tickle you. And for me this year, the device that kind of took me down that you know, somewhat less trodden path is the NEC Levy Mini. And that's for a couple reasons. For one, it basically looks just like a netbook from 2007. I'm getting weird flashbacks to college right now, which is not something I'd ever thought I'd say on a stream like this. It's also definitely a modern machine. It's got one of Intel's 11th generation Core i7 chipsets, 16 gigs of RAM. It's a proper, you know, up-to-date PC, but what's interesting about it is that it also kind of doubles as a game console. There's a dock you can plug this thing into, connect it to your TV and get proper 4K, 60 frame per second gameplay. And if mobile gaming is more of your thing, you can attach this weird sort of controller thing to the back and make it sort of an AirSat switch, except an AirSat switch that has full access to your Steam library. I am personally just very tickled by this thing. So I'm very pleased to invite David Bennett, the CEO of NEC PC and the president of Lenovo Japan to tell us a bit more about the Levy Mini and how concepts like it make the transition from prototype to product. David, welcome and thank you so much for your time. I know it's kind of a weird hour over there. Hey, no, Chris, it's my pleasure, and thanks for having me. I'm I'm pretty excited to be here. Uh, that makes two of us, especially because to make this happen, I just I slid into your DMs very randomly. <laughs> um, uh, I, there's a lot of things I want to ask you about the Levy Mini and sort of the process that shaped it. But in the interest of telling a, a fuller story, I feel like we need to pull back just a little bit, David. How how does a Canadian guy ultimately become the CEO of one of Japan's most, you know, sort of storied PC brands? No, that's a that's a great question. Um, so, you know, as you know, I, I, maybe many of your your readers or your viewers don't know, um, but NEC Personal Computers, NEC PC, is a, a joint venture between Lenovo and NEC. Um, NEC, obviously, being one of the huge Japanese brands uh, here in Japan. Um, but you know, you know, my story is, uh, you know, to be honest, I've been back and forth to Japan for many years. I started in high school. I went in an exchange program. I fell in love with the language. Fell in love with the culture. Um, and, you know, I went back and forth for many years, a university graduate school. Uh, and then right out of, uh, you know, I went to Japan for the last time with a, with a program called the JET program, where I was uh, working in, in a government exchange between Canada and Japan. And then my next job coming out of that was working for a company that many of your viewers may have heard of, AMD. Uh, and I was with AMD for 12 years. Um, and my first couple of years was actually based in Tokyo. So that's kind of where I started. And, uh, you know, it's been been all uh, an exciting ride from there. So, so you pointed out an interesting sort of facet of the industry, which is that Lenovo and NEC have sort of, I believe as of 2011, they sort of embarked on a joint venture to build PCs. And then in 2016, Lenovo acquired more of a stake in that joint venture. So I guess for, for my clarity and for the clarity of our viewers, you know, what is, what is the sort of relationship between NEC, PC and Lenovo now? Is it a subsidiary? Is it something else? That's a great question. So NEC Personal Computers is a joint venture between Lenovo uh, and NEC. Um, and you're correct, in 2011, uh, 2011 is when it started. Actually, we're coming to our 10th anniversary this year um, of the of the joint venture. And then in 2016, I think Lenovo took a larger majority stake. So essentially, it is the, the NEC Personal Computers is now a subsidiary of Lenovo, um, but there is still ownership. There's still part ownership uh, by NEC Corporation. So, for example, um, although I'm a Lenovo employee, I work for Lenovo, I have regular meetings with NEC Corporation, and we work very closely here in the country with NEC to make sure that we're following brand guidelines, that they're aware of what we're doing. Um, you know, I participate in a board meeting with them on a monthly basis. So it is a very, very close relationship here in Japan. You know, it's it's really interesting. I am, in, as I mentioned, I'm in Gadget's senior mobile editor, and your position, you know, is not entirely a unique one. Len Motorola is probably the example most of our viewers are probably familiar with. Lenovo uh, acquired the company, operates it more or less as an independent entity, but there is still some level of relationship. I know Motorola gets to kind of benefit from the fruits of Lenovo's production prowess. So, 
how, how does that sort of work in Japan for you? What's the relationship between your team and, and sort of their higher ups? You nailed it. I think it's it's incredible. I think Lenovo's approach to these kind of partnerships um, is, frankly, the right way to do it. And and what I mean by that is Lenovo is the number one PC brand in the world. Um, it's one of the biggest PC, if not the biggest PC company in the world. So for a brand like NEC, uh, what we're able to do is we can benefit from this huge scale, um, this huge technology resource and pool that Lenovo has, while at the same time, we can take what we're good at here in Japan. You know, if you look at NEC personal computers, um, you know, we've been around since the late 1970s, um, and we're really, really good at driving technology. We're really good at materials. We're really good at designing lightweight PCs. So we can take our strengths, we can combine them with Lenovo scale and backend and really do some exciting things. So, um, you know, I think that that kind of marriage between this large global scale, uh, huge company, the technology resources that they provide, but still been able to address the market in Japan through NEC Personal Computers, which is the number one PC brand in Japan, um, is a fantastic match. I guess I'm, I'm, that's that's all really helpful context, but I guess I'm really sort of curious about you know, the nature of the relationship, right? Like you mentioned, for example, that you are in fact a Lenovo employee, but as the sort of head of NEC, are you having to knock on their doors to sort of get uh, sort of approval or clearance on embarking on different products or projects or, or, or I guess explain to us sort of this, what level of autonomy NEC has with respect to Lenovo here? Yeah, so that's, I think that's a very fair question. So if you look at our Lavi brand, our Lavi brand mm -hmm. is fully owned, um, I would say, by um, Lenovo side, meaning that there's nothing we really have to do, um, you know, legally, there's nothing we have to go check. Lavi brand we own, we can go drive, we can do whatever we want. However, on every Lavi product, there is still an NEC logo. Um, and of course, um, the NEC Corporation is um, very interested in knowing how we're using that logo and what we're doing with our products. So, uh, you know, in a nutshell, I think the way it works is for our consumer products like the Lavi Mini, um, I provide an update to NEC Corporation. I let them know what we're doing. Um, but I don't think it's something that we have to go and ask permission. We operate very autonomously, um, I think, with kind of sort of a friendly relationship with NEC. Um, there's another line of products, for instance, on our corporate line of products, mm -hmm. where I think it's a very different story. Um, that's primarily driven by the NEC side. And I think we operate almost like as an independent, um, an ODM for their commercial business. Um, so I think if you look at, depending on the line of business, how we operate is very different. Consumer side, very independently. Commercial side is more of a, um, you know, a partnership in terms of how we go to market. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Uh, from the consumer perspective, it almost sounds like you're just kind of licensing NEC's name to put on products that are being developed. It sounds almost wholly by Lenovo. Is that sort of a fair way of looking at it? Um, I wouldn't go that far. You know, if you look at one of the interesting <laughs> parts about NEC PC is that our R&D, um, our design, our manufacturing, our support, our sales, our shipping, everything is done here in Japan. Um, so uh, we're not taking Lenovo technology and licensing and throwing a brand, um, although that's certainly something we can do. Um, but if you look at you know, some of our best-selling designs, if you look at the Lavi Mini, um, these are all conceptually designed here in Japan. Um, R&D is done here in Japan. Um, you know, we work directly with the manufacturers, whether it's overseas or whatever, to go design it. So I would say a lot of it's homegrown here in Japan, as well as leveraging some of what Lenovo is doing. So certainly not just a branding. I think Lenovo gives us the freedom to really drive new designs and ideas right here in the country. David, I got to say, I could talk to you about sort of the mechanics of your relationship with Lenovo and NEC all day. I do not know why this is the kind of stuff that I love, but I did bring you on to talk about the Levy Mini more specifically. And I, I guess... I really do just want to be blunt here, and I hope you'll forgive me. But you know, looking at this concept, you know, as I said, sort of seemingly netbook inspired, but with a very specific focus on gaming. Why? Why is this a machine that Lenovo, NEC, sort of the totality of those brands? Why is this a machine that they felt needed to exist, or at least be talked about? So that, that's a great question, and I'll be very open. You know, I've been here three years, um, and this is one of the first projects that I conceptualized and I, I, I kind of worked with the team to go drive. And I think, Chris, you nailed it. The reason that the Lavi Mini exists, I think there's two twofold. One, personally, I wanted a machine that I wanted, meaning that, you know, I love to play. I love gaming. I love PC gaming. Um, I love the old form factors of the netbook. Now, I take a little bit of a uh, 
uh, I wouldn't go as far as saying it's a, a netbook, right? Most netbooks were 10 or 11 inch. Um, I wanted something mm-hmm. that in a, in a more compact form factor that also wasn't limited by the performance. Netbooks were great, but I think um, you know when users started to, to, to play with them, they found that maybe the performance was a little bit lacking. I think with Tiger Lake and what we've done in the design, as you said, we can. the goal was, I told the team, is I want to be able to play the games that I play on my PC. When I'm on the train in Japan, we, we spend a lot of time on trains. I want to be able to have that same experience um, or at least something that's passable. So maybe I, I drop down the settings a little bit compared to my gaming desktop, but I still want to have that PC gaming experience on the road, in a cafe, on the train. Um, and I challenge them to go do that. You know, number two, I think if you look at the, the market in Japan, um, Japan is one of the only markets where you had um, 10 inch Windows tablets, where you had small form factors, Windows PCs that were still selling like crazy. Now, in the last couple of years, it was funny. I'm like, well, what happened to all of those ultra mini PCs? We call them UMPCs. And when I looked into the data, it said, oh, the market dropped when NEC stopped selling them. I'm like, well, okay, <laughs> we're NEC. Let's start, you know, what if we started selling it? Is there still a market? And I'll tell you, this is still a concept PC, right? We haven't talked about a release date or anything. Um, but the interest that we've seen in Japan, and frankly, from your readers and from all over the world, you know, I kind of proved me, I don't want to say proved this right, but I, I think there certainly feels like there is interest in this type of form factor. Yeah, let's let's dig in uh, a little more closely. Just uh, run through the specs very quickly uh, and correct me if I've got any of this wrong. Uh, we've got an 8-inch touchscreen running at 1900 by 1200, one of Intel's 11th Gen Core i7 processors. As you point out, this is a, a Tiger Lake chip, uh, 16 gigs of LP DDR4X RAM, and I believe this is uh, 4266 megahertz RAM, a 256 gigabyte M.2 SSD, two USB 3.1 Type-C ports, plus a couple extra ports ports on the dock that one might use to connect the Levy Mini to a TV, and an optical touch sensor sort of in place of a proper trackpad. Now, these, as, as you mentioned, are not specs that one should easily turn their nose up at. So just, just to make absolutely clear, this is, uh, this is meant to play AAA games, maybe not at the best settings, but you're, you're really trying to play the best games available for the PC now on a machine like this, correct? You nailed it. I mean, if you look at Japan, there is no bigger system than the Nintendo Switch. Uh, and I think if you look at Nintendo Switch, it's great, um, but there's certainly a type of game that you can play on it. I think the challenge to the team was, I want to take that PC gaming experience, those top AAA titles that you're playing today, and how can we take them on the road with us? And as I said, if you look at NEC PC, our strength, our strength is in materials, it's in making things light, it's in making things small and compact. And I said, let's apply that to the PC. How do we? How can we make something where we can get the performance we want in that small form factor like that and be able to take it on the road. Um, so you nailed it. I think the specs, if you, they speak for themselves, but uh, there's, I think there's uh, very few games that you can't put on the mini um, that you can't at least um, you know, get a, a playable experience, if not a, a fairly good experience uh, on the road. I guess, I mean, that, that opens up a lot of questions. And, and, you know, as you point out, you know, this very much seems like a device that would be tailor-made for, for play on trains. J- Japan, obviously, a very train-heavy society. Yep. Um, but, you know, what, what sort of impact does this design have on playability, right? Like, I assume the battery can only be so big. Heat would be an issue. How do you sort of work with these factors? Yeah, no, you, I mean, you absolutely nailed it, right? Those are the things that we have to think about when we go into this. Um, if we can only play for an hour or two, then you're not getting that experience, right? Um, so when we're designing this, obviously, I think heat, it, the, the two obstacles that we had to overcome were heat and battery life. Um, I can't get too much into the specifics, but if you look at the way that it's been designed, and we did a lot of work with Intel, I have to really, I mean, Intel really stepped up. This is one of their innovation products. We always do, every year we try and do an innovation product with NEC uh, and Intel, and this is the one we chose to do this year. And we put a lot of work, both teams put a lot of work to make sure that we could overcome that heat and battery issue. So if you look at it today, uh, our goal was how can we be able to play for three, four, five hours, AAA game at the same time, um, especially NEC, we've got very big, very, uh, I would say, high standards in terms of the um, heat temperature and the skin temperature uh, qualifications that we need to be able to sell a PC here in Japan. Um, So I'm pleased to say that the Mini meets all of that. You're able to play it three to four hours straight. It doesn't get too hot. Um, Obviously, it gets warm, right? But I think it's well within where our NEC standards are. Um, So I think that's something we had to overcome. Now, you talked about the the gaming attachment, right? Uh, We've got the We've got the dock and the gaming attachment. I think when we looked at it, and this has been, I would say, in the pipeline for about a year and a half, um, gives you some idea on how long it takes to conceptualize and bring something like this to market. Um, but I think one thing that the Nintendo Switch really 
helped educate the market with is especially here in Japan, but around the world, now it's not strange for you to take a device and, you know, tap it into a dock, put it into a dock and have it pop up on your TV. Or it's not strange to put a device like, you know, you're the mobile editor, senior mobile editor at Gadget. No issue to take a mobile device and put a um, joystick, put it into a joystick dock and play that on the road. So I think we've had some devices that have come before us that have normalized or made that kind of attachment fairly common. Um, I just haven't seen it done with a with a fully functioning Windows PC. And that was our goal is let's take it what's kind of been accepted now in the market, a dock that you could slide it into and pop up, light up your TV or a gaming dock where you get a great joystick, a great uh, experience with a with like a handheld. And how do we put a Windows PC experience around that? And that's kind of where we conceptualized where we came with the concept. So I guess I, I'd love for you to kind of spell out a little more clearly just sort of the the nature of the relationship between sort of using the Levy Mini as sort of a proper PC in and of itself versus yep. a gaming machine, right? Because as you've said, I mean, the Switch obviously is a huge, huge seller around the world, especially in Japan. It has influenced the way we look at designs and just sort of how yep. we approach uh, the sort of physicality of gaming, but you know, this the Levy Mini has a keyboard. Like it does look like it's expected to be used on some level as a machine you can send emails on or browse the web on. So how do you how do you sort of balance those those priorities in a device like this? Yeah, so I mean that's a great point, right? I told you in Japan, it's an interesting market. One of the only markets where you had this small Windows form factor that was still uh, going strong for a long time. Um, and I think if you look at that, a lot of that is because there's a lot of people on the road, there's a lot of people on the train, uh, and today everything's done on the cell phone. So you've got this two thumb kind of thumb input that we see um, on the cell phone. Uh, the design that we had was okay. First and foremost, I wanted a gaming machine that we could play on the road, we could play Windows gaming. At the same time, there's this huge need in Japan to be able to not just type an email or type a text, but how do you do more work when you're on the train or more work when you're in a coffee shop um, that's not just limited to that kind of text, email, really simple uh, input interface? How do you design a PowerPoint? How do you write a Word document? How do you do some creation, some content creation on the road? Um, if you look at the market in Japan, um, the PC market is actually relatively smaller in terms of PC per person. The ratio is, is relatively smaller in Japan. A lot of work is done on the cell phones here. Um, my goal was how do we take a, a, an input that is familiar to the Japanese market and take that to the PC? So if you look at the way the Lavi Mini is designed, when you hold it in your hand, you're actually able to reach every key with your thumb. So if you're typing an email or you're doing your text, uh, we wanted something where you could game, but you could also get that kind of work done as well. And you could actually use a input format that was more familiar to the Japanese user here, uh, which is to be able to use your thumbs to type. So if you look at the Lavi Mini, when you're on the train, you can take it in your hands, you can type with your thumb, you can type out your emails and your text. When you get to your, your cafe or somewhere that you want to actually do a little more serious work, you can put it down and the keyboard spacing is big enough that you can actually still type with your, type like a regular keyboard as well. At the same time, like I said, Windows gaming in the past, you've had to kind of put your Windows gaming experience on hold, go play some mobile games, and when you get back, you can continue your progress. Now we can do all three. You could do your text um, like you do today, your text and your emails with your thumbs. You can put it down. You can do some content creation with a little track point. Um, I don't want to say track, not, not a track point, but something like a similar, <laughs> uh, similar to a track point uh, and a keyboard. And at the same time, then you can take your PC gaming and do it wherever you go. So we tried to do all three in one device. That's really interesting. I, I got to tell you, looking at the sort of press release images. I the last thing that would have entered my head is the idea that one would use this thing sort of propped open 180 degrees with your thumbs on the keyboard playing a game. But does does that explain why the Levine Mini has round keys for better key separation to reach with your thumbs as opposed to a more traditional kind of keyboard? That's a good, so uh, interesting. So if you look at Japan, um, there's been this huge, for the last 20 years, um, they've got these uh, electronic dictionaries, uh, which are very mm. common. I think you'll see most students, uh, most young business people will be carrying around these electronic dictionaries, which is actually a very similar form factor. Um, and if you look at the input, um, those are all done with somewhat rounded uh, keycaps. Um, so I think when we were designing the Mini, I think that what's a familiar interface for the Japanese market here? And uh, when you're in a small form factor like that, we find that the rounded keys are easier for your thumbs to slide into. So actually, it's been designed from the grounds up um, with that sort of ease of thumb typing in mind uh, to get the rounded keycaps. Now, when we take that and we start a regular typing experience, when you put it down on a table and start using it, um, we did a lot of user testing, a lot of A-B testing back and forth with a, you know, a fairly large sample size here in Japan. And we found that the rounded keycaps weren't a hindrance. In fact, uh, the majority of users actually preferred it on this smaller form factor. 
that's fascinating stuff. I, <laughs> I, I really enjoy just kind of geeking out with you about the specifics of, of Japan. Well, think, think of design. Your- Sorry to interrupt you, Chris. Think of the BlackBerry, right? Um, you know, when we move to the iPhone, when we move to the kind of the traditional form factor today for smart devices, there's still a segment of the population that says, "Man, I miss, I miss having that keyboard. I miss having that tactile uh, Ooh, keyboard interface." Very to type. vocal minority. <laughs> they're a very vocal minority. But what if you could do that on a device? You could, you could get that on your texting device, on your instant messaging device. That same device could. then be your sort of PC on the go device. And that same device could then be your gaming device. That's kind of what we had in mind. How do we bring that back for that vocal minority? That is that is pretty wild. But I have to ask, you know, given all of the little facets of this machine that do seem specifically tailored for a Japanese audience, do you yep. do you feel like there's any kind of international appeal here? What have you seen so far? So it's a great point. As a Japanese maker, first and foremost, I'll be very open. Um, this is designed for the Japanese market. Um, now, why we brought it to CES, um, again, I'm not Japanese, no matter which way you spin it. Um, and this is a device that I wanted. And I said, I, we challenged the team. And I said, this is it was something that I really want to take home with me. So I had to believe somewhere that there's a demand for this type of form factor uh, elsewhere in the world. So I think the goal with this concept PC is we take it to CES, we put it out there. Now, the next step is I'm really interested in the feedback from your users and the feedback from anyone that sees this product. What do they think? Is there demand out there in the world? Is this something that, again, if we look at Lenovo's large worldwide scale um, that we consider taking to the rest of the world, is there a demand out there? And what do we need to change or what what improvements do we need to make uh, to go bring that out? And I think that's really the purpose of bringing it to CES this year. I want the feedback, frankly, from people like yourself, Chris, and your viewers, your readers, to really tell us what else do we need to do to make this a hit or make this something that could sell outside of the Japan market. I'm confident it's going to do well in the Japan market uh, when we decide to bring it to market. Um, But I think the real question is, what do we need to do uh, to maybe take that next step? Let's let's say for the sake of argument here that you know this conversation that you and I are having, you know, my sort of relative excitement for this thing, that is sort of uh, that that is expressed at large by a big number of tech enthusiasts. You know, were that to be the case, what what would the next steps be? You know, is there a working model of this in Japan somewhere that just gets sort of you know uh, prepped for for mass production, or, or sort of where are we in the life cycle? I guess. That's a, I, this is the time where I'd love to kind of pull it out and show, open it up and show you. Um, but I'll be very oh, open. I think there is. Oh, no, I, there's actually two or three in existence right now. Um, and we took two of them uh, were actually done for videos and photos for CES. So they're currently with a marketing agency that would design, help us design some of our materials. And the third one is actually in the labs. And it's in the labs because what we're doing is we're doing a battery of testing to make sure, as you said, the battery life, the heat, and how does it perform on the latest games. Now, What's the next step? Um, you know, frankly, we've brought this to market. There is three working samples. It runs great. I'm very pleased with it. But of course, after you get these kind of working samples back from your from your manufacturing process, there's things that you see that you definitely know you want to change. So right out of the gate, there's a couple things that we want to tweak here and there that we think need to be improved. Um, so right now, I think between now and let's say if we decide to go launch this, um, we've got an opportunity to make those final tweaks on the hardware. We still have the opportunity to change that hardware. So as with you know many companies, but Lenovo is very, very um, interested in the voice of the customer. You know, it's very important to us to make sure that we understand what the customer wants. This is an NEC statement, NEC PC statement, and a Lenovo statement. So my next step is, I want to take this feedback that I get from worldwide. What is it that you know the the reviewers like yourself say? Well, this looks good. You know what? This this seems a little bit weird, or I wonder why they didn't do this. We want to take that feedback, the voice of the customer, um, take it with the things that we saw that we wanted to change. And I think I see another rev that we would like to do this year. And with that rev, I think then the first step for me is okay. How do we think it's going to sell in Japan? Um, potentially do a, a limited run in Japan. And then based on the feedback I get from around the world after the CES launch, if we see any markets where there's enough of an interest or enough of a, I would say, a voice from from the end user that says, hey, this is something we might be interested, then I think we take a look at it market by market. Can you give us a sense of, I mean, I, I personally want things to go well for the Levi Mini because I just want to, it, it seems like such a peculiar device to have something focused pretty firmly on gaming and being able to deliver a perfectly playable AAA game playing experience in a machine that you can also type on your thumbs with and also peck out emails in a cafe. But can you give us a sense of what 
uh, to what extent COVID-19 has affected the team's ability to kind of get together, work on these products, and ultimately push them to market? Yeah, you know, this is something um, that certainly has had an impact. You know, I think if we look at the situation here in Japan, um, I think it, um, up until very recently, it's been a little a little better controlled, I think, than in other countries in the world. Um, you know, we've been fortunate that my design team and my engineer team um, have, have been able to kind of stay together through most of this. Now, what we're finding now is just like other countries in the world, we've now had to work remotely. Um, and we've seen our typical, uh, I would say, time to market is delayed. Um, it's hard for me to say exactly how much, but I would say, you know, at least a couple of months. Um, I think the challenge we have right now is that these kind of user testing and these kind of things, the feedback that we want in some cases are things where we need to be um, doing this with the user directly. We want direct feedback. We want to see how they use it. Uh, and it's difficult mm -hmm. to do during this time. So we're trying to uh, not have it cause too many delays, but to be very open, the kind of feedback that we need a device uh, for a device like this um, is not just how does it perform, what's the FPS, um, you know, what's the battery life. Um, we really have to see how is the user using it, how are they touching it, how is the space between the keys, um, how is the key touch, um, are they able to intuitively put it into the dock and put on the game controller. And these are kind of things that we need to have this kind of face-to-face in-person testing, which, as you said, Chris, is frankly is being delayed, is is causing a, a few delays. Um, and this is something we were hoping to have that next rev come out a little bit earlier uh, than currently is scheduled. I think it's safe to say that, you know, the events of the last year and change have maybe not gone the way anyone had wanted them to. But, you know, we're here now. You've you've got three working models of the Levine Mini. You've got at least one person pretty excited about what this thing is capable of and, and quite a few others sort of watching this uh, as well, I'm sure, are, are enthusiastic about what a really sort of high-powered, portable gaming computer could do. I mean... I, granted, I completely understand the feedback uh, is not there yet for you to kind of make a decision to move forward or to move in a different direction. But based off of what you know, based off of our conversation, based off of what you've heard from people so far, w does this thing have a chance? Are you? Is there a chance we actually get one of these in the real world someday? Uh, yeah. Again, another another good question. I think um, I was. The team, I think it was certainly a, a bunch of high fives going around the office the last two days. Um, we were all very nervous. Um, you know, NEC PC um, is, uh, you know, a very... Oh, sorry. NEPC is a very big player here uh, in Japan. Um, but of course, worldwide, um, not so much. So I think uh, around the, we kind of felt confident how we thought it would be received here in Japan. And I think it's kind of gone according to plan. But we were, I would say, pleasantly surprised um, by the feedback we've seen from, uh, you know, people like yourselves and around the world. Um, and I think that's given us a little more confidence to say, hey, um, if there is this kind of interest, um, this is something we should take a little more of a serious look at. And I think, um, like I said, I think this was designed with something that I would want to use. And me not being a typical Japanese uh, consumer, I just felt like that there would be potentially other people like me around the world that would also have kind of a similar desire for a device like this. So I would say um, we can't commit to anything at this point. Um, but to, to your words, I would say I think there's certainly a chance. And I think that the feedback we've seen coming out of CES shows me that there is a need, a demand for this type of form factor, uh, not just in Japan. Well, David, I wish you the best of luck. You've you've made at least one fan. Even though I'm not entirely sure why I want this thing, I do want this thing. You've made <laughs> at least one fan here. So thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. I'll let you get back to your day. That was David Bennett, the CEO of NEC PC and the president of Lenovo Japan. Coming up next here on the Engadget virtual stage, we have a roundtable featuring uh, reviews editor Sherlyn Lowe, UK bureau chief Matt Smith, and senior editors uh, Nick Summers and Jess Condit. They'll be running through the news of the day and just kind of giving you an update on where we are in the show. After that, we have an interview between our managing editor, James True, and Nick Woodman, the CEO of GoPro. You're definitely not going to want to miss that. And at 4.30 Eastern time today, speaking of things you're not going to want to miss, um, I and our reviews editor, Sherlyn Lowe, will be hosting our live Best of CES ceremony. It'll be a good time. I know we're at least going to have a lot of fun with that. I hope you do too. Thanks for watching, and we're going to kick it to the roundtable.
everyone, and welcome back to Engadget's virtual stage here at CES 2021. I'm Reviews Editor Sherlyn Lowe, and joining me today for the Engadget Roundtable are some faces we have seen or maybe don't get to see as much as I would like uh, on the Engadget video channel. So we have UK Bureau Chief Matt Smith joining us today. Hello, Matt. Hey, Sherlyn. Long time no see. Very long time since I last saw you this morning. Uh, also joining us today here is Jessica Condit, our senior editor. Hey, Jess. Hello. Wonderful to see you as always. Love you. And also we have, all the way from the UK as well, uh, senior editor <laughs> Nick Summers. Hi, how are you, Nick? <laughs> hey, it's good to be here. Almost stumbled there, but you, you managed to pull off. I almost stumbled because every time I think of your name, Nick, I think of the song Here Comes the Sun, and I don't know why. I think it's got to do with an old joke from way back in our past. This is, this is the last day of our CES live coverage, at least for the stage, uh, and I'm exhausted. I'm sure you guys are. I'm going to ask you, Nick, starting with you, usually this is like, I don't know if it's your once in a year chance, right? But it's my once in a year chance kind of to see you in person because you're based in the UK, I'm in New York. I at least get to see Jess at some other events sometimes. Nick, how has covering this remotely been for you? Both easier and harder in, in sort of different respects. I mean, it's a lot easier in the sense that I don't have jet lag, right? And there's no travel mm -hmm. involved. I have to worry about my ESTA visa and everything, all the kind of logistics <laughs> where I'm staying, check-in times, no, the, the, having your CES pass, where you need to go for appointments, all of that is like all taken care of, right? So that mm -hmm. part of it has been great, but it's also been a lot harder in other respects, you know? Like one of the things I was doing this year was judging the sustainability category for the CES awards. And just having a kind of sense of everything that's at the show and kind of really feeling like you have everything covered is so much harder online because you can't sort of physically zoom around venues the same way that you would do normally at the show. We're just trying to pour through press releases and that sort of thing. So in some ways it's been easier, but in other ways it's actually been a lot harder to do my job um, than in previous years. So yeah, it's been really interesting. I love that we have both you and Matt on this roundtable because this CES, uh, you know, you guys' covers can be so focused on the U.S. sometimes, but CES is a global show, right? And we, we need to think about how people from all over the world are watching this. Matt, do you have any, any thoughts for, for, you know, what these experiences have been like maybe for people from other parts of the world? That's the thing. That's the interesting thing about this one is that, um, and you've mentioned it, share on some of your other your other pieces on the live stage. Is everyone is seeing things with the same eyes? Um, well, there have been a few pre briefs and bits and pieces we've got ahead of time. A lot of people are seeing these uh, devices and announcements on a live stream, you know, beamed across the world at all the same time. So you get reactions mm -hmm. from around the world, <laughs> at, at, you know, at exactly the same time. And that's kind of interesting, you know, everyone's on the same starting page. So I find that quite fascinating. Um, but yeah, it's, I kind of agree with Nick's experience of it. It's great not to have jet lag. And I swear <laughs> just not eating giant Vegas food has, you know, added years to my life. So that's nice. Um, <laughs> right, there we go, thumbs up from Nick. So that's all been good. Uh, but yeah, I miss seeing everyone and I miss the kind of the hunger for the story. I like hunting around for the weird, unique, you know, devices, robots, uh, announcements, and I kind of miss that vibe to it all. It's not quite the same through a webcam. For sure. Speaking of all the, the stuff that you just said, right, robots and the quirky announcements, I mean, Google usually has a giant playground on the parking lot, yeah, yeah, yeah. and we're not going to do our little video tour of that this year. Jess, uh, I mean, what, what do you miss the most from the show floor? And, and, you know, do you feel like a virtual CES has been able to replicate any of that? Yeah, I mean, similar sentiments. Um, I've actually, I remember being paired up with Nick one of these past years during CES, and we were on the same beat. So we were looking for a certain type of gadget on the floor. And Nick, you're a very discerning man. When you get in the groove, you're very focused. And I appreciate that about you. Um, but like, yeah, stuff like that, you can't, you can't even collaborate with your partners in the same way. So like not even being close to you guys and just being able to scream across the trailer, like, yo, what was that thing? Or, Hey, was that cool? Was that worth talking about all those conversations? Yeah, we could have them in Slack, but it's, it's just a totally different vibe. Um, and I mm -hmm. think like in-person collaboration is where a lot of the magic happens. Um, mm -hmm. so, so especially in our field, it's, it's a creative field as much as it is, um, informative and, you know, fact-based. Um, so yeah, yeah. I, I miss that. I miss that. 
You mentioned uh, partnering with Nick, and I want to talk about why we partner with each other. Now, the way we judge the official Best of CES awards here at Engadget is that two editors, most of the time, are assigned to each award category, and those are the two people really responsible for rooting out all of the products that are being announced at the show that would you know qualify in that category. And then we have discussions, we come up with a short list, and then the whole team votes. This process is often long and arduous, especially if it's in person and it goes on late into the night. We're fighting over Chinese food uh, about why something should win. Uh, I would love for y'all to be a fly on the wall in that room someday. But this year we didn't have to. I'm curious to hear though, uh, Matt, let's start with you. What were your award categories that you were in charge of this year and, and what are some of the nominees in there? So I was uh, teamed up with Chris Velasco to do best mobile category. Um, I only had one category because I can't be trusted. So that was nice. <laughs> um, running through the nominees, um, it was a kind of a weird split between prototype concepts and anything made by TCL. Um, <laughs> I mean, we've already we talked about this recently on the podcast, Sherlyn, but let's uh, start with uh, the one phone that's genuinely a phone that's coming, the TCL 20 series. I think the full name is the TCL 20 5G. Um, it's nominated because it's an actual phone. Um, it's a phone that, you know, it's one of these great specs phone, that are very, greatly specced phones at a very reasonable price. I think it's it comes in about $360. It's already out in parts of Europe already. Um, I think it's coming to the US, but that hasn't been confirmed by TCL. And yeah, there's nothing particularly wow. It just looks like a very stylish, functional, you know, decent mid-range phone. And I think it's always good to have more of these. More competition is good. And it's always nice to remind everyone, let alone in gadget readers, that you don't have to buy a new, a new phone and pay out $1,000 each time. Um, I think that's especially apt at the moment. The other TCL thing was something you saw, Cher. It's the Thank next you. paper. It's a TCL tablet with a color e-ink display. Um, you took the briefing, so you got to see it in action. What was it like? It was not actually e-ink, but very similar. It was more like a paper-like display, and it was like LCD-based technology, so just very low, uh, like it's low brightness, but it's really about eye protection, right? Reducing blue light and, and, and flicker. Um, and because it's able to do away with backlighting because it reflects light, uh, there is a lot of battery and uh, size benefits, right? It can make really much thinner tablets uh, than otherwise you would have with traditional LCD. Um, so yeah, thanks for that rundown, Matt. Uh, Jess, you usually have some of the more intriguing categories at the show. What were you in charge of this year? Well, I had gaming because yes. gaming. And uh, then I also had accessibility, uh, which mm -hmm. so, I want to start with that one, actually. Um, there wasn't as much in the accessibility category just to go through. Um, I think that mm -hmm. this is a category that could use some love most years. Um, there are sometimes gadgets that are built directly for the, the uh, disability community. Um, but, but this year, there, there, was, there, was really, there was really not a lot. So um, one that I found that I actually really liked, though, was this thing called Good Maps Explore. It's an app mm. designed to help visually impaired and blind people um, navigate outdoor and indoor spaces. So outdoors, you can just like hold up your phone and it'll read out cardinal directions to you. It'll read out points of interest or streets that are in front of you, just kind of helping navigate. And then indoors, uh, the company that makes it is starting to map with using LiDAR, map indoor spaces like libraries and museums and then implement that into the map. So you can have step-by-step -step directions through a library, you know, toward the restrooms or toward a certain section or a water fountain. Um, just things that really aren't possible yet. Um, this is, they're using camera-based positioning systems. So hopefully something that's accurate and a little less um, intrusive and expensive than like a beacon system. Um, mm. So yeah, it seems like a pretty cool uh, idea. And I was really into using technology um, in this way to really to really help this community. Um, and then, of course, Samsung has a robot that they're talking about that will <laughs> help you in the house, bot handy. There's this, this mm -hmm. like little butler robot that they, they're showing prototypes of. Um, and, you know, and then there's also, um, there was a product that wasn't actually like accessibility focused. Um, it's called the Mudra Band. And it's it's basically adds um, functionality to your smartwatch that allows you to use just one hand. You don't have to, you don't have to use another hand. You can, uh, kind of just control it using, using the hand that it's on, um, which is not necessarily 
um, you know, for the uh, disabled community, but it's something that has implications in this space. Um, so, so those were the accessibility ones, but mm -hmm. gaming is pretty fun this year too. I'm what scrolling do down to so like my list. Yeah. So gaming this year <laughs> for me was all about like laptops. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's all about mobile uh, just power. And we have, so I'm going to go through the list. Intel's Tiger Lake, their H series, what are they the 11th generation H series CPUs. So these are going to, this is going to bring like desktop power to laptops is the promise. Um, and that's a, that's a very cool thing. Um, and then the AMD Ryzen 5000 series laptop chips. These I think are, this is a really cool uh, uh, series because it's going to, it's going to bring desktop power to a lot of ultra portable kind of size uh, laptops. And that's that's interesting to me. Um, but then there's, you know, Razer has a laptop, Asus has a, a laptop, the ROG Flow is really lightweight. Um, it, mm. it's, it's about like mobile gaming for us this year. That's, that's definitely like one of the products that's firmly within our wheelhouse with gaming laptops and stuff. And, and the accessibility stuff you talk about, I think it's very important that we pay more attention to it. Um, you know, as an industry, we could definitely do better there. Nick, though, you tend to cover at CES some of the less in our wheelhouse categories, I feel like. Is that true, would you say? Yeah, I would definitely say my my beat is often offbeat products uh, and trying <laughs> to find some of the kind of the weirder and more wonderful things, um, which, yeah, I guess leans a little bit into my the category that, as I mentioned previously, I was doing this year, which was sustainability. Um, mm -hmm. It's definitely something that we are interested in at Engadget, but it can be quite a broad topic, you know? Like I won't say, for instance, I'm not super well versed on electric tractors, for instance, right? And some of the right. agriculture and farming technology that's happening at the moment, but it's something that we want to always be aware of and make sure that we highlight when there are innovations. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, going into this category was was really interesting this year. And it really started with a bang in with Samsung. Um, I was so appreciative that Samsung spent quite a lot of time during its um, press conference talking about sustainability and the environment. Um, they recapped a little bit about their cardboard packaging for some of their TVs, which started with their kind of artsy TVs, the Cero and Serif, I think they're called, which could be repurposed into sort of um, flat pack uh, origami construction sets for kids and how they're bringing that now to all of their TVs that are coming out. And so they call this not only recycling, but upcycling, you know, having mm -hmm. make sure that they have extra uses. Um, so that was something which was really cool. But the two which ended up making our list for or our short list for, for the category was the solar cell remote. So this is a solar powered mm. remote, which isn't a new idea. I've definitely seen this before, but it's really cool that Samsung, which sells God knows how many TVs every year, millions upon millions, is going to be shipping one of these with all of its 2021 TVs. So all of those TVs that would normally come with remotes that require batteries, which either are single use or, you know, hopefully people have rechargeable sets. Now they're going to be shipping with a remote that is, you know, doesn't require that, which is great for the environment and um, potentially will, will, you know, help people avoid tons of e-waste. So that was great. Um, following on from, from that was um, a new part of their upcycling program. They've talked previously about using phones in the community, helping people use them as part of eye monitoring kits for eye checkups and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But now they're going to help you do that from home. So if you have an old device lying around, a Galaxy Note 2 or something, they're going to be releasing apps that help you turn them into something else, um, whether that's a baby monitor, some kind of smart home monitor, something that's quite simple but still has a purpose and is smart kind of in its own way. So those were kind of the two the two headliners for us. And even though neither is particularly groundbreaking, just because of Samsung's scale, we kind of knew they were going to have a really big impact in the market. So that was cool. And then outside of that, I picked two startups, one which is called Lasso, which is working on a appliance for your kitchen, which can deal with a lot of recycling, um, plastic, glass, uh, aluminium and steel, which is cool. And also a company called Living Packets, which is working on a reusable, infinitely reusable, infinitely recyclable uh, box, which is going to replace all of the cardboard boxes that we are having sent to our homes at the moment, right? As we do so much of our shopping online, they're trying to come up with a box that retailers can use, you know, over and over again, send to customers, you use them for returns, all of that sort of thing, which will hopefully get around that particular problem, which has only accelerated and only worsened throughout this kind of ongoing pandemic. So yeah, I was I was definitely 
intrigued what would end up on our shortlist, but I think we ended up with four really good contenders. Now, thanks to all of you for kind of summarizing some of our uh, Best of CS Awards nominees. Now, uh, there is also one category called the People's Choice Award. And shout out to the people who are watching us live right now. I guess that's all of you. Um, but if you're, you know, you still have about 15 minutes before voting closes on the People's Choice Award. The options that you can pick from are all of the nominees that made it on the uh, finalist list across all of the 14 different categories that we have covered. Go to Engadget.com. You can check out a uh, description of all of the finalists there and make your vote. Again, the, close, uh, the voting closes at 3 p.m. Eastern. So you have 15 minutes as of right now. Uh, and then come back 4.30 p.m. Eastern later today for the Best of CS Awards show where we're going to announce all of the winners. And that'll pretty much set the stage, I guess, for the rest of the year. Uh, but before before we get into some of those that future talk, I also wanted to shout out our live stream viewers that are active on the live chat right now. We've got Mark Dow, who is one of our regular viewers who seems to have been with us all day today. Mark Dell says that as a fellow Brit, he is very excited to hear Matt and Nick on the panel today. So, hello. Uh, and then also hi to Yuri, Marcia K, DJ, uh, Norman Robinson, Arian. Just so many names. We are so grateful you decided to join us to get your CES coverage here. And we have plenty more coming up for you. Now, uh, we've gone over some of the widely covered devices from our Best of CES finalist list. But I kind of wanted to recap a little bit of what happened today. There is not a lot uh, of news today, given it's the third day and most companies have shared all they wanted to share already. But Asus had a, had a little surprise for us. And this is kind of cute. It's um, it's a, what, a coffee mug, a latte mug projector. I think, <laughs> Nick, I, 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 I'm going to ask you to describe it for us. I know you just, just did a lot of describing for us. But Nick, what, 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 what can you tell us about this little Asus latte cup projector? Yeah, I mean, you've almost summarized it perfectly there. It is a portable projector, which also doubles as a speaker. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it has a Harman Kardon speaker built inside of it. But it is the size and shape of a coffee cup. Um, and that's mm -hmm. kind of all you need to know about it. And at first I was like, oh, cool, I, I, I guess that makes sense. But the more I thought about it, the more intrigued I was by it. Because if you look at it, it's kind of similar in terms of the form factor to like a Google Home speaker, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. in terms of the kind of size and shape. And the more I looked mm -hmm. at it, the more I thought, you know, this is something which I'd be happy to have on my bookcase or on my coffee table. Right. And when you're not using it, you could sort of just kind of turn it around a little bit and it will probably blend in as an ornament, you know, or something that's just like a piece of furniture. It doesn't stand out like a traditional projector would, or maybe when someone says projector, the kind of image that you, that you have in your head. And it's also cool because it is that shape, you know, my, my in theory, right? Anywhere that you have a coffee cup holder, like in your car, for instance, or even in a camping chair, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. There's probably more places that you can put it than a traditional portable projector. Um, something that I've always been impressed by is companies like Peak Design, for instance, who made a travel tripod that is the same size and shape as a one liter water bottle. So if you have a backpack, it fits into those same pockets. In theory, with mm -hmm. something like this, it fits into the same places that a coffee cup would. And the more I think about that, the more kind of neat I think it is. I, I, I do think, and, and and for the viewer, by the way, I wanted to give you the full name of this. This is the Asus Zenbeam Latte Projector. Latte is in the name. Matt, what do you think of this product's name and, and just the whole proposition? I mean, I aspire to one day own a projector, like some mm -hmm. real fancy projector that will take over a whole wall of my future giant mansion. So I'm mm -hmm. always in the market and look at them. And this one, like this one seems like quite an appealing travel projector, if you can think of that as a concept. Um, it only does 720p resolution, so it's not, you know, it's not a mind boggling resolution. It's not the best projector and the battery only lasts three hours ish so and me and nick oh, in, in the uk chat have been talking about lord of the rings today you wouldn't be able to watch a whole lord of the rings movie before the battery Aww. cut out apparently i know sorry guys bad news um but yeah i like the design and you know asus does this every now and then apart from like it's horrifying routers that look like you know dead yes. spiders upside down like they sometimes like just like to kind of charm with their design and yeah it's quite a cute little looking projector um i can't wait to see how much it'll cost um as yeah. a cs tradition there's no price but yeah I'm, I'm here for it i have a question about it actually 
I yeah, I wonder it, how much of the cute factor is due to the name. If it wasn't called a latte uh, projector, yeah. you think it's cute. That's all. I'm just gonna leave us with that. Yeah. That, I mean, it has like uh, it has some Hal vibes to it. Like if you just look yeah. at the picture and don't think of the name, yeah, like a Killbot three thousand thing, yeah. Oh, I mean, uh, the wrong. fact that Latte is a name, I think to Jess's point, like if I hadn't made that connection, I probably wouldn't have thought this was such an interesting product to begin with. It'd just be like, eh, another projector, you know what I mean? And yes, it looks better than previous projectors. Yes, it's a little smaller and more portable looking, but just does bring up a good point. Um, also, people in the in the chat also are bring up another good point. Uh, that name, the word Latte projector, sounds like they're projecting Latte into your mouth, doesn't it? Just what you think. Yeah. It sounds delicious. So I want the one. coffee. So I mean, they already have a step up. This is branding, people. This is how it goes. <laughs> if you just okay. want to watch YouTube videos of people brewing coffee with it, then, you know, you you, you go for it. There's, there's nothing saying you can't do that. Uh, that's true. You can just project only coffee streams. <laughs> uh, another really intriguing product that may have otherwise slipped by had not for Engadget Chinese doing a good job covering it, I think, is the Avita Admirer Admirer 2. This is a laptop with a with lights built in around the display bezel and three Finally. cameras above the screen. Yeah, Matt has been dying to own one, clearly. But Jess, what what were your initial thoughts when you saw this? I want one. Um, yeah. <laughs> like straight up, this laptop. It's like okay, it has three webcams. It has a ring light around the the frame, but it also just looks yeah. like you know pretty slim. Looks like a pretty good laptop. Um, right. But I think this is such a good idea. Like the entire border of the screen has a light on it. It's like a it's like a ring light for all the Twitch streamers, or if you just use it for Zoom calls, even I'm sure that would be fine. Um, and then hey, three cameras. Why not? I love it. Why not? Nick, would you ever use something like that? Absolutely, if it is subtle when the lights are turned off. I don't want to have a thicker bezel around the outside of my screen or compromise in that way. But the idea, in theory, if someone says to me, would you want you know, your dream Ultrabook, but it also has an amazing light attached to it, which can be used for yeah all of our Zoom calls, all of our meetings. If you have kids that are going to be attending classes, you know remote learning, and just want to make sure that they're properly lit and people can see them. Like the idea isn't as crazy as I think it seems on on first blush, um, yeah. but it really does depend on how subtle it is in normal use. Matt, if you use this device to Zoom call me, I would say Matt, you look like you're lit. <laughs> uh, is this is this round table over <laughs> what i was going to say is um we were talking about the latte name this is called the admirer which seems so <laughs> atrocious right it's like it's all about me this is my yeah. laptop it has three cameras it has a ring light let's all watch me and look at me admire me with my admirer too yeah. that's all yeah. kind of it that's a that's the grossest part of the whole thing is the name we, we should say that it's spelt something like A-D-M-I-R-O-R. -R. So it's not admirer in yeah. the sense, but it basically is admirer. Right, yeah. it's almost mirror. It's, it's almost, yeah, it's all very self-absorbed. That is true. The word mirror is kind of in the name. It is very, it's like admire your mirror. There's like double layers to it. Um, Horrifying. I want to also, yeah, I want to shout out also to uh, chat. Um, we have Mr. Kefis one I believe asking what our favorite announcement has been at this time let's start with jess what was your favorite announcement well uh, i'm going to say the first two that popped into my head were the mofflin little hamster gerbil thing it's a little robot that cuddles you it's very cute so that's yeah. one and then the the sony's um air peak drone which i actually thought looked really badass um it's it holds uh sony's uh, what are they? The Alpha Series cameras, and it looks really cool in action. They showed off a video of mm. a Sony drone holding a Sony camera, filming Sony's electric car. So, Sony's here. That's that's crazy. That's <laughs> impressive. Matt, what about you? What's your favorite? I mean, just stole it from me. Um, yeah, I'd really like. Maybe it's just because it's you know it's kind of a 
in 2021, it feels like a year of like, sounds like a cliche, but a year of healing, of being gentle, right? Of being kinder and like a soft, cuddly robot just kind of resonates with me more than it would any other year. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I really liked the notion of it all. And have you seen what it charges in? It charges in this like little nest egg thing. It goes to quote unquote <laughs> sleep inside it. I mean, that's adorable. It's it's so endearing. Um, I think the other major one, and again, Jess has already re- talked about it, is the Ryzen 5000. I think that could be a big deal when it comes to powerful ultra thin laptops next year. Um, so yeah, I can't mm-hmm. wait to see what, what laptops it actually ends up in. Um, And yeah, what kind of amazing gaming options we'll get from it. Well, Nick, how about you? Is your favorite also the Mothlin or are you going to surprise us? I agree with Jess, but actually for the Sony stuff, um, I'm also really intrigued by the AirPeak drone. I mean, it, it feels increasingly like DJI is the only company in town that anyone cares about, right? So many of their competitors are struggling. And like Jess said, this is going to be a Sony built drone that takes A7 cameras, which are, you know, the A7S3, for instance, is the camera that every vlogger wants at the moment. Every YouTuber is using this, Twitch streamers. So they already have this kit. Um, And so to have something purpose built that fits into that ecosystem, I think is amazing. Sony also Mm -hmm. showed off their first consumer ready speaker that is going to have their 360 reality audio stuff Mm. baked into it i think that's a really compelling alternative potentially to sonos and these sorts of companies and we got to see a bit of a glimpse of their electric car like jess said you know there's so much hype and talk around at the moment about what apple might be doing with an ev but like sony's already there they're already doing it and in previous years, I've always been a little bit disappointed by Sony. It always feels like we watch a press conference and they show a movie trailer that we've already seen, you know, and the Ibo gets rolled out for the fifth time in a row. But this <laughs> year, they had three things, all of which I kind of cared about. So for Sony, I think that's a massive home run. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm going to pick two my favorites, and, and um, they're only my favorites because they're uh, so wild. Number one, Razer's RGB mask, because it's just crazy. It's called the Project Hazel. Why not? Why not, Razer? Wow me. Impress me all the time with your with your willingness to go far out there. Um, these are these are masks with built-in, you know, air filters and then RGB lighting on the outside, but they're also transparent so that people can see your expression and read your lips, which is good for people who need to read lips. Um, and then the other thing for me. Uh, and this maybe just flew under the radar a little bit, but Samsung is backing an outside startup. This is part of a CES announcement for its C Lab, uh, more experimental division. Uh, it, it is going to back a online K-pop training service, and this is one of my favorite things so far that I don't think a lot of people are talking about yet on our show. Uh, <laughs> Yo, tell me more right now. I need to hear more about this. Just- Yes, you and I are signing up for this. We're going to take classes together, online yes. K-pop training classes together. You'll see. We'll be the next KDA. <laughs> I can't wait. Next KDA. Um, oh, no. I know. We, we have just a little bit more before the end of this roundtable. So I just wanted to ask you guys, how do you think a lot of these products that were announced, right? Not all of them are coming to the public. Not everyone's going to be able to interact with some of this new technology that was introduced. So what do you think 2021 looks like based on the technology? What do you think is the one piece of technology that will really impact everyone's life uh, the next year? So let's start with uh, you, Matt. Uh, uh, what, why me first? And now I'm panicking. Um, you can I have one if you does Okay, yeah, you can go. Just go. Well, because I, I have one. I don't want you to steal it. It's <laughs> um, the, the Samsung Solar Cell Remote is a very cool piece of technology that's actually coming to market. That's actually going to um, immediately start kind of helping mm-hmm. in the goal that it has, which is reducing uh, battery waste and all this stuff. So mm-hmm. I, I think that's a really cool product and it it's it's actually happening. So I like that. Let's go to you, Nick. Well, are you ready to answer this question? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, we've looked at a lot of gaming laptops this year and a lot of gaming chips, um, which are probably out of the reach for most consumers. But eventually, 
that tech is going to start filtering down, right? And what was expensive is going to get cheaper. And at the moment, both PC and laptop sales are going through the roof. They are stronger than they've been for years because people are buying them for their kids who have to study at home, either they're working from home, that sort of thing. So everything that we're seeing in the PC and the laptop space right now is eventually going to come down to a point where people that are buying laptops right now or for later this year are going to benefit from that. So, um, yeah, I think that's going to be really important this year. Matt, how about you? Uh, I have one now. Thank you for coming back to me. Yes. Um, I think <laughs> the one that caught me, and this was another one that was kind of hidden under the headlines, like the K-pop training service, whatever that is, um, is LG is building a kind of entry level series of OLED TVs. The A1 is going to be the first one. We still don't have prices, but this is going to be a kind of very basic OLED that kind of has the TV features you saw in top end LG OLED TVs, OLED TVs a few years ago. Yes. Um, yeah, but at a more comfortable price point. Um, they might not be the most cutting edge TVs for the, you know, the gamers and the cine cinephiles among us. But yeah, I love the idea of just everyone having an OLED because I just prefer watching things on them. Like the idea that my parents might have an OLED when I visit is kind of cool. Um, I'm still using an LED TV myself. So it might be time for me to upgrade as well. And yeah, I, it's LG again. So I, again, I trust them to deliver on these kind of products. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do my one last shout out, which is uh, L'Oreal announced that YSL is creating this device that will allow you to make thousands of lipstick shades at home for yourself. It's going to be pretty expensive, I'm sure, but this technology could help reduce waste in the beauty industry. I'm excited to see it move forward. Uh, so I'm hoping for more on that. Now, that's all the time we have for the Engadget Roundtable. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. And thank you to my dear panelists for joining me. Thanks, friends. <laughs> all right, so next up, we'll have more content for you coming your way, but be sure to come back at 4.30 p.m. Eastern because we will be announcing the official Best of CS Awards winners here on the Engadget YouTube channel. Thank you again for watching and stay tuned for more. Hey everyone, welcome back to Engadget's live CES 2021 coverage. I'm Senior Editor Devendra Hardwar, and tonight for this session, we will be talking about the future of gaming laptops with uh, Jeff Campman from Asus ROG. Uh, how are you doing, Jeff? Thank you for joining. Hey Devendra, thank you for having me. I'm doing really well today. I'm really pumped. <laughs> Yeah, it's so yeah. exciting. I mean, this is actually it's a big day for you guys, right? Because uh, you yeah. just announced several new laptops running on the new NVIDIA hardware, too. Everyone's excited about yeah. what a lot of this means for upcoming gaming laptops. There's also the new AMD chips. What are you excited about that's coming from Asus ROG? Well, I, you know, I, I have to say everything, but the particular. <laughs> um, yeah. I, the, the the combination of the new AMD chips and the new NVIDIA GPUs has those build those basic building blocks have allowed us to do so much. Mm -hmm. um, not and so we've taken that basic uh, architecture and we've reconsidered the form factor of the gaming laptop in a couple different ways. And the the system I think everybody's the most excited about is the ROG Flow X13, uh -huh. which is our first two in one convertible gaming laptop. Um, and that, so that system by default has the AMD Ryzen, um, a new Ryzen CPU unit, a GTX, GTX 1650, um, within the body of the laptop, but it also includes our new, or, or you can get it with rather the XG mobile GPU, uh -huh. which is a proprietary eGPU with, uh, an up to an NVIDIA RTX 3080 that communicates yeah. over a PCI express, uh, by eight link for much more this, bandwidth than Thunderbolt 3. Let me just say, this thing looks wild too. So the uh, yeah. the X13 is a 13-inch 
ultra portable. It's uh, very light. I believe you guys are saying it's 2.8 pounds. It's also a convertible, so you <laughs> can move the screen yep. all the way around like uh, like a lot of the other laptops these days, like Lenovo's Yoga line in particular. And yeah, yeah. that's a really interesting thing you guys are doing um, by both giving it, you know, GTX 1650, not too bad. You could play some basic games with that, uh, especially for yeah. gaming on the go. Yeah. But the option of an eGPU with this one is kind of uh it's unique too because yeah it's a proprietary connector right. it's um what pci3 basically you guys are just getting the full yeah. speeds there um right. can you talk about what you know what went into asus's uh thinking as it was developing this right because i feel like i've seen slim 13 inch uh, gaming notebooks from other companies like razor i've never quite been super satisfied with them they are always about compromises mm -hmm. is that why you yeah. guys thought like you got to have a, an eGPU option so um, it's interesting you bring up compromises because yeah. one of the things about one of the ways we approach things at ROG um, is we don't want to compromise for gamers and like all the e, you know eGPUs as a concept are really neat. Um, I, I love the idea of being able to take a slim gaming laptop and then just mm -hmm. plug it into a powerful graphics chip when I need it. Um, but you know again Thunderbolt three um, is it's fine for a lot of things but it limits GPU performance. Uh, and also, when you look at most eGPU boxes, uh, they're mm -hmm. rather large and bulky. It's not something you can easily take with you. And so right. this, um, yeah, we've, we've done two things here to kind of avoid those compromises. The, the eGPU itself is much more compact than the average um, box. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. about the size of a really large paperback book. Um, and... It used, yeah, to make that happen, you know, it's like we used a yeah. custom vapor chamber cooling system in there, um, you know, and then again, the um, that proprietary interface enables higher performance. So we've just um, we've taken that idea of, you know, take a slim laptop with you and paired it with that no compromises ideal. And um, that I, th I think comes together in a really compelling package. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, and also it seems like a smart follow-up for you guys from the Zephyrus G14 last year, which okay. that was one of my favorite gaming laptops. Um, it was something I just kept going back to throughout the year because it was super light. It was three and a half pounds. It was still pretty portable. <laughs> um, it had enough power. It had RTX yeah. 2060, and it was one of the first with the AMD uh, Ryzen 4000 GPUs, and it kind of just set the stage for what we would expect from the rest of 2020. Um, so going into 2021, it seems like, yeah, you guys are trying to one-up yourselves here. Um, right. yeah. Can you tell me anything else it's about even, the X13? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it, again, you're saying it's, you know, the G14, we really love that notebook. Um, it yep. set a new standard for portable gaming laptops. And the X13 is just that much more portable. Because you have to remember that, that this is almost like a, th you said it's almost like a thin and light notebook, but this still has the full Ryzen HS processor in it. It's the 35 watt, um, eight core, 16 thread CPU. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's all that same processing power in an even more compact body. So, yeah, it's gotcha. in, you know, mm -hmm. right. So again, the, the power in here, um, at least for you know CPU intensive tasks, is just incredible. Yeah, and also and so, um, just yesterday, Intel announced their new uh, H series chips too, but also not mm -hmm. the like fully powerful, not the eight core ones. We had, they were announcing these four core right. chips uh, for ultra portable gaming laptops too. It does kind of seem like that is what AMD was already delivering last year. Are you guys looking at these, uh, the newer H series chips, the quad cores in terms of putting them in any new machines or are you more so, um, satisfied with uh, what AMD is doing? Yeah. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Okay. Like obviously, can't, yeah. Um, I can't comment on future products, but we'll have, um, I, you know, we have more to announce at CES 2021 and, um, mm -hmm. yeah, stay tuned. Stay tuned. I mean, listen, we all know yeah. Asus has another event tomorrow where we're going to see mm -hmm. a lot more new laptops as well. And those are going to be the consumer yeah. lines of the Zen books and stuff. So yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, you guys also announced a new, I guess, a special edition of the Zephyrus Duo yeah. 15, the, you know, huge gaming laptop with dual screens. Yeah. Um, and now it's powered by AMD chips as well. How much of yeah. an upgrade is this over the one last year? Because we really liked uh, the last Zephyrus Duo. So um, I th again, I think with the um, the Ryzen, the new Ryzen 5000 series CPUs, um, you're going to see a significant performance uplift. You know, simply because the performance per core uh, is higher. Um, I th the 
Um, more, there's other stuff happening with this too, though. We have a new 4K 120 hertz display option. So, yeah. you know, we're taking, you know, up until this point, uh, creator laptops or get laptops with 4K displays rather, you know, you have a 4K display at 60 hertz. Um, and to get that high refresh rate gaming performance that a lot of demanding people want, you had to drop down to mm -hmm. 1080p. And now we have this option that encompasses full Adobe RGB. We have 4K, we have 120 hertz, we have variable refresh rates all in one screen. Um, and so that, yeah, that, that's a huge upgrade there. And that's obviously the new and, uh, NVIDIA, mm -hmm. NVIDIA 30 series graphics as well. So um, yeah, we I, I think it'll be really a pretty substantial about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you uh, know, when it comes to the, the Zephyrus Duo as well, um, we haven't talked much about the screen pad. And I do think that is, you know, that's the unique thing you guys have been doing uh, with the, with both the ZenBook du uh, Duo and the Zephyrus Duo. Is anything changing <laughs> with the screen pad plus? Uh, can you do anything different with it? I think you guys have talked about some software upgrades. How is it going to function differently than last yeah. year's Zephyrus Duo? So, yeah, we'll, we'll have more detail on this soon. Um, mm -hmm. There is... Uh, there is, however, um, I think in terms of the hardware, what we're doing this year with the Zephyrus Duo SE is uh, yep. we're making this more accessible because um, there's a 1920 by 1080 display option for this notebook now as well. And, you know, we're also taking uh, the Red screen pad plus down a little bit to make it more attainable. So uh, that'll be available to more users. And like you said, I think Asus is really driving this innovation in the dual display laptop space. There's really nothing else quite like this out there. So getting this in more hands is super valuable, I think, because everybody who uses this um, immediately sees the utility in it. I think a lot of creators, a lot of streamers who love that multi-display setup on their desks um, just immediately take this like ducks to water. So yeah, I'm excited to see it in more users' hands. Gotcha. Great. And you were just talking about the new 4K 120 hertz panels. Those sound exciting, but honestly, as a gamer and like a very practical gamer, I, I am not quite a believer in 4K on mobile. It just seems like yeah. you're you're generating so much power to produce these pixels that you will never actually see. I think a better compromise this year is we're seeing a lot more quad HD 1440p displays. Are you guys looking, you know, are you implementing those in uh, in the rest of your lineup too? Yeah, a number. Of, so we're, yeah, our lap, our display um, lineup this year is I think better than ever. Um, yeah. The 17 inch, the Scar 17, our top esports gaming laptop, is getting a 360 hertz uh, 1920 by 1080 display with adaptive sync. Um, mm -hmm. We are also bringing uh, those quad HD 165 hertz panels uh, to more laptops this year as well. Very nice. So yeah. Very nice. Yeah, that yeah. balance. I, I agree that balanced resolution is really nice because it still lets you uh, take uh, advantage of all your hardware's performance, especially with adaptive sync, um, mm -hmm. without you know going over the top. Um, yeah, without so yeah. without going. And we, and we over started. Point. Also, yeah, mm -hmm. we, we started last year. I was just gonna say we started uh, with Quad HD last year with the Zephyrus G14. Um, yeah, with the that high res 60 hertz option with adaptive sync, and again, you know, we're we're just taking it up a notch this year. Uh, the 14 inch mm -hmm. panel and the G14 is getting up to 120 Hertz with quad HD. And, um, yeah. And yeah. other, our larger gaming notebooks are getting the 165 Hertz option. You're saying that, so that for this yeah. year, the G14 is going to get 120 Hertz quad HD. That's, that sounds pretty cool. Um, yeah. and just for everybody watching and listening here, you know, what are we talking about? So 1080p screens is it's just full HD. You know, it is the first yeah. one of the first HD standards we got when HDTV started rolling out. And what's been happening on gaming laptops and gaming monitors is that uh, they're they've been sticking with that resolution, but upping the refresh rate so that you can actually see higher frame rates on those screens. And now, yeah, you're all the way up to 360 hertz. So that's astounding. Yeah. Uh, will lead to a lot of smooth gameplay. I don't know. I do think there is kind of a tipping point when your eyes actually start to determine the difference. Like maybe hardcore esports gamers really will see mm. something different between 240 hertz and 360 hertz. I, for me, like 120 is like, okay, I'm good here. Like, and if I can get enough performance to get to 120, I'm good. So yeah, mm -hmm. if you're talking about right. quad HD screens, which have a higher resolution than 1080p, not quite as high as 4K, but quad HD mm -hmm. at 165 hertz, like that is... That sounds like a sweet spot for a lot of gamers, honestly. Yeah. 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 And more options are great. 
you know, you can get whatever you prefer. So, <laughs> yeah. um, is there, you know, I, I know ROG's lineup is always, you guys have a huge array of models. You have, you know, thicker, heavier computer uh, laptops for people who want, uh, who don't need portability because you can stuff more power into there. Is there anything more, you know, you guys think you can do, uh, this year, thanks to the RTX 30 series or the new, uh, Ryzen 5000 series. What are these laptops, you know, achieving now that we couldn't last year? Um, I think just in general, um, again, like Moore's law may be slowing down, but you know, there's still yeah. always improvements in performance per watt and, um, in a highly constrained system, like a laptop where every watt matters, like if you can save a watt somewhere, you can put it somewhere else, or you can make the system run cooler and quieter. Um, and I think just having these great building blocks to work with from our partners, uh, you're just going to enjoy better performance and better battery life. And, you know, the, just across the board, um, that rising tide is going to lift the entire performance of these systems. Mm -hmm. So, gotcha. And I'm sure you guys are experimenting with a lot of different, um, you know, form factors or new things. Like I didn't see the X13 yeah. coming at all. Like that just seemed like a, a wild thing for you. Um, I'm sure you can't talk about future products, but you know, yeah, ideally given, you know, you've been in this industry for a while, I assume, um, you've seen the landscape change and we're getting more power available to us, more efficient chips. What do you think gaming laptops need to do, you know, over the next five years to really stay relevant and to evolve from what they currently are? So, um, the way things are progressing, the way things are evolving, uh, mm -hmm. like you said, uh, ROG experiments all the time with these innovative form factors, like the ROG mothership uh, from a couple of years ago was, you know, we, we just turned that traditional laptop concept on its head and created this freestanding system that could draw air through its back panel instead of having mm -hmm. to like try and breathe through that couple millimeters underneath a notebook, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the X13 now, which is a two-in-one gaming laptop. Um, with touch and pen support. Um, so that's a lot closer to the everyday notebook. And um, the Zephyrus uh, Duo 15 brings dual screen productivity to the gaming laptop form factor without appreciably increasing the size and weight. So we're increasingly um, progressing towards a point where I think the distinction between a gaming laptop and a regular laptop is you know, that line is going to continue to blur because you have these systems that there are no compromise. Um, they, can, they are not just for gaming, they're great for content creation as well. The uh, X13 um, is you know, a highly ultra portable system. And you know, it, it's just a, a portable laptop. You don't have to think about the fact that it's gaming ready. Right. You can, um, right. And when you want to take that gaming power with you, you can just throw the eGPU in the bag. So yeah, mm -hmm. I think and, the, um, mm -hmm. that again, that line is just going to continue to blur and we're going to continue exploring um, all these new form factors that enable these new experiences. Gotcha. And yeah, just judging from what we're seeing from other manufacturers too, I do think that is the case. Like we're just seeing uh, more and more ultra portables that can do a lot more. And I think, hey, we, uh, we've reviewed plenty of systems with Intel's XE graphics, even Intel is really mm -hmm. kicking things up a notch on the graphics front. Um, you know, I'm really wondering, like uh, at Aces, how are you? How do you guys think of your ZenBooks now versus the ROG machines? Because it does seem like I look at something like the ZenBook Pro 15, which has a decent GPU in there too, um, right. or the ZenBook Pro Duo uh, has a decent GPU. What? Why is that a productivity laptop and not a gaming laptop? Right. Right. Well, there's you know. <laughs> like we were saying, you know, the lines are blurring a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. There's always going to be, I think, um, a, a demand for uh, this kind of creator notebook, like especially with NVIDIA Studio drivers or, you know, mm -hmm. maybe a OLED panel, especially. I think that's going to be something you're going to be seeing as a deciding factor in our systems. Uh, the uh, ZenBook Pro Duo you mentioned, that already uses an OLED screen. Um, at 60 hertz, um, and you know that's just spectacular for HDR reproduction, which is you know I, free, something we'll freely admit it's not something that's really easy to do in a gaming laptop screen yet. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, for for people on the in the creative side who are still trying to push the limits there, you know we're 
always going to try and serve those different audiences as best we can. And so gotcha. where, mm -hmm. no, right. You had mentioned HDR too, which I think is more and mm -hmm. more on the console front has become, you know, kind of a nice benefit to have. The Xbox Series X has automatic HDR using, you know, um, Microsoft's machine learning tech. And I think that's done a lot to really mm -hmm. even make older games feel better and more playable. Uh, what is holding HBR, HDR back on the laptop front? Is it just the sheer amount of power it takes to, you know, make a screen brighter? So, yeah, I think it, that is a significant part of the challenge because uh, last year at CES, um, one of the neater demos that we were able to do was that a mini LED panel for a laptop. So instead right. of having that uh, global backlight, which, you know, is a component you can kind of uh, control the power consumption of mm -hmm. more easily, you know, you have these huge arrays of LEDs um, and it looks amazing. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, the more components you add, each of those has to draw power. Uh, the power management becomes more complicated. Um, and it's it's a it's something we're continuing to uh, explore and reckon with. Um, but, yeah, it, power is a huge concern, obviously, with notebooks. And we don't want to compromise anything else about the experience. For sure. For sure. I get that. And it does seem like mini LED tech is the new display tech a lot of people are really talking about now. We're seeing more TV manufacturers bring it in. It is it basically gives you what much, much smaller backlights for LCDs than traditional right. LED backlights. Um, you know, mm -hmm. given given the power issue, like will we be seeing more of these in Asus laptops in the future? Because I, yeah, battery life is a, is a big concern, but I also want that like nice mm -hmm. bright performance sometimes when I want right. when yeah. I choose to have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like yeah, like I said, it's a continuing balancing act. Uh, it's something we're exploring. Um, like we had the prototype last year, um, mm -hmm. and you know when when we uh, when we crack it, we'll have more to share. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know we're talking about all this and the concern of battery life too. I was really impressed with the the G14 last year and just like how efficient it was battery wise. It was. Even it gave me more battery life than some productivity laptops I've been testing recently, too. Mm -hmm. Is that just really down to what it, what AMD was able to accomplish with the Ryzen chips last year? Are we expecting similar decent battery performance this year with 5000? Um, yeah, I think there. Yeah, it played a large role in that. You know, the G14 also has a large battery um, for its mm -hmm. size. Uh, but yeah, I think AMD, you know, if, if you follow AMD closely, they are you know, they're laser focused on um, power consumption and efficiency. I think that they have an initiative called, uh, I forget what it's called exactly, but you know, there, mm -hmm. there is a continuing focus there to reduce power consumption, increase efficiency. And, um, you know, I, I think that'll pay dividends over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we, we were already, yeah, you've already seen it with the Ryzen 4000 and, um, you know, we'll, yeah, I, I think we'll see great things from battery life in our laptops for 2021 as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is nice to see the industry kind of changing so much too. Are, do you feel like we're better served now that AMD is taking a bitter, a bigger stance in laptops? Because two or three years ago, that wasn't the case. And it was kind of all Intel all the time. Is this competition mm -hmm. actually leading to better computers on the gaming front? Yeah, I think so. And the, um, again, as a PC enthusiast, um, more options are always a good thing. You know, mm -hmm. it's one of the great things about the platform, uh, that openness and flexibility is that you can get what you need at the price you want. Um, and just having more options is, you know, it's, it's always a good thing. So, um, and you know, it, and you know, again, you know, it's, it, they drive each other forward and, uh, we all, we all reap the benefits. Gotcha. Gotcha. I'm thinking about what else I'd like to see in my ideal, you know, my ideal perfect uh, ultra portable, which will probably look a lot like the G14, but maybe with a webcam. And I know we've seen <laughs> mechanical keyboards on some heavier, you know, thicker gaming laptops, like the really serious ones. But what is uh, keyboard tech is something that I think really matters, especially if your keyboards, your main mm -hmm. gaming interface. How is Asus and ROG thinking about that? Um, will we ever see like a, a mechanical equivalent in a thinner, lighter notebook? So it's, it's funny you mentioned that because I think on the ROG Strix SCAR 17 uh, and 15 that are coming out this year, we're actually introducing a new um, optical mechanical keyboard. 
Um, and we talk about the thickness of uh, mechanical key switches. And actually, one of the neat things about the optical keyboard is that it's, you know, I think it's thinner overall. Uh, uh -huh. While still, and it give, lets us maintain that same good key feel um, that you expect from that mechanical keyboard. So um, that is an area of innovation for us as well. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, so that um, that experience, uh, just keep an eye open for it. To yeah, come to more yeah. Assist. I uh, I would love to test those at some point. So I'm probably going to check out and see what's available for review. Uh, just thinking, we're coming off of a fall where the new gaming consoles kind of were the things everybody was talking about, right? And it started to make clear like, mm -hmm. hey, for a while that, you know, PC gaming has led the way, has been forward. And then all of a sudden, Microsoft and Sony are coming in with newer, faster SSDs, right? Then were available to most PC gamers, um, you know, kind of the equivalent of stuff you're, you, we, we would be seeing with PCI 4.0. Um, mm -hmm. Have the new consoles at all changed the way Asus is thinking about what it's actually delivering? Like the fast load times on the PS5 is something I still cannot mm -hmm. achieve on a gaming PC, you know, no matter how fast of an F SSD I put in there. Um, is it revealing some deficiencies or some, you know, some upgrades that the PC industry needs to make too? I mean, I think, you know, every time a bar is raised, you're going to see people rise to meet it. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, it, the console, if the consoles have improved, um, that architecture, um, then, you know, it, again, that's, that's a new bar. That's a new shift in the industry. And, um, I think, you know, SSD manufacturers will be, have to be aware of that. Uh, system architects will have to be aware of that. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's not something like that we may see change in the immediate term, but, um, yeah, yeah. again, yeah. I, I think uh, every, you know, in, we are relentlessly in pursuit of more performance. And um, mm -hmm. the again, every time the bar is raised, um, that that's just that's just a new um, frontier to conquer. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it'll be interesting to see. I do like the back and forth between console gaming and PC gaming because these consoles now are just basically super fast gaming yeah. PCs, but. Fast gaming PCs that cost five hundred dollars, which is yeah, kind yeah. of a wild thing. Uh, I, I want actual <laughs> PC, you know, gaming equivalent towers to come down to that price. So, looking forward to seeing that. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, Jeff, for you know telling us uh, telling us about what Asus is working on and talk about the future of the industry. Where can we find you on the internet these days if people want to see more of your thoughts? So, I would encourage uh, everybody to check out the. Um, content at rog.asus.com, which is where we publish all of our articles about internal projects like these. Um, you learn more about our products there, including all of the details of our new gaming uh, laptop lineup. Um, and I'm on Twitter at, at jcampman if you want to chat with me there. Gotcha. Yeah, I just saw your tweet. So yeah, yeah I will follow you back. <laughs> and you guys can find me at, at Devendra on Twitter. Stay tuned to Engadget.com for more live coverage of CES 2021. Next up, we're going to have a discussion about Sonos and the future of music streaming. Thanks for
and welcome back to Engadget's virtual CES 2021 stage. Thank you for watching with us. If you've been here all day, oh my gosh, thank you so much. And if you've just tuned in, welcome. Uh, this is the laptops panel for CES 2021, and it's about what laptops will look like for this year and beyond. And uh, joining me for this conversation, we've got representatives from HP and Lenovo, starting with Mike Nash, who is the Chief Technologist and VP of Customer Experience for Personal Systems over at HP. Hello, Mike, welcome. Hey, hey Sherla, thanks for having us. Of course, and then from Lenovo, we've got Dilip Bata, the Chief Customer Experience Officer for the company. Dilip, thank you for joining us. Great to be here, Sherilyn, and uh, good to see you, Mike. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, it's really nice to have you both here. Now, I, I wanted to do this panel because I thought, look, at CES every year, we hear about the iterative upgrades. We hear about the newest chips that are going to be in the latest consumer laptops. Right? We've got the 10th gen, the 11th gen, the next, next, next gen and onwards. But your two companies stand out to me in general because in addition to providing these iterative upgrades or con constantly chasing the thin and light, which is laudable and, and something that we like to see every year. In addition to that, the your two companies often bring something quirky, something new and fresh that we haven't seen to the table. So I just wanted to kind of talk about that and how your both your companies kind of create your products, right? So. Just for CES 2021, let's start with HP. Mike, can you tell us a little bit about the news that your company had to show for this year's show? Yeah, I think honestly, Sherilyn, the most important thing that's going on is really how we're building products that support what HP calls one life, the bridge between your work life and your personal life, and making mm -hmm. sure we're building products that really help us deal with what's becoming the new normal. The fact that I need to have yeah. great conferencing, so a great webcam, great microphones, one of the things we're super excited about is some of the AI-based noise cancellation that instead of using yeah. the angle with which you're speaking, we instead use AI to filter out things like a dog barking or a lawnmower. Um, right. Also a lot of investment in five megapixel cameras on our Dragonfly Max to make sure you've got a super high resolution experience. And it's the sensor, not just the resolution that makes that experience be so awesome. Yeah, for sure. You you brought up the uh, Elite Dragonfly uh, Gen 2 and Max. These are two of the more uh, intriguing products you've announced here. You've also announced the Elite Folio. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we're super excited about that. I think the Elite Folio is a device that, what's cool about it is it supports a number of different postures. Uh, it supports <laughs> a clamshell posture, a consumption posture, and a, you know, a tablet posture for using your stylus. What's amazing about that is, unlike say an iPad, it really is designed to let you work, use technology to work the way you want to work, as opposed mm -hmm. to making you change the way you're doing things based on a small limited set of postures. I also love the new pen in this device. It has a, a, a garage place where it can be stored, not be lost like it is in some other devices. And it's always being charged. And of course this device is really cool because it's wrapped in vegan leather. So it's got a yeah. metal, uh, frame, but the outside makes it think like it's really a, like it's a folio. That's the name. I mean, that's that's what really stood out to me. The Spectre Folio, I believe, launched in 2018, and that was the first time we saw this sort of vegan or leather covered uh, laptop design. And back then, you did explain some of the benefits with this. Can you kind of remind us what these benefits of the half sort of leather build are? Yeah, the, the key benefit, first of all, the, in, the, in the previous version, it was actually real leather. And we got a lot of feedback oh, yeah. just in terms of durability and in terms of environmental aspects to having vegan leather was a better choice for a lot of customers. So in, in mm -hmm. our commercial customers, we focused on that. But the benefit is it has like a very personal feel. It feels like a high-end purse or, 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 or a folio you carry around but it has all the functionality. And as you're showing in the B-roll here, what I love about it is it easily transforms from one posture to the next in a way mm -hmm. that really supports the different ways you want to work or play. So annotating things up with the pen, watching a video on Netflix or Hulu in consume mode, but also being able to be really productive in the clamshell mode. And uh, we'll get to Lenovo in a second, but just on the Elite Dragonfly really quickly too, I wanted to mention there's a large or significant part of the Dragonfly series of laptops that are built from 
uh, I believe, recyclable or ocean-bound uh, materials. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. We're very focused on feedback from customers that says, not only, frankly, as humans, we want to make sure we're leaving the earth in a better place than we found it, but also, frankly, it's become a very important purchase criteria for our customers. Customers are willing to you know, seek out and choose and maybe even pay a premium for a device that has otherwise ocean-bound plastic. So we're really excited to be using a large percentage of the, of the plastic parts from plastic that otherwise be floating around the ocean someplace. And again, it's really important um, in you know the aspects of how we manufacture PCs to make sure they have more ocean-bound plastics. Um, so number two, make sure that our packaging is becoming much more environmentally appropriate. And frankly, really our focus on Energy Star to make sure our devices as they run are being much more frugal in their use of energy. Now, switching over to Lenovo, uh, Dilip, do you want to run us through some of the highlights of what you've announced uh, at CES so far? Yeah, I mean, Sherilyn, just to give you a little background, uh, one of the things, uh, a lot of our products you'll see are generated by customer insights. Uh, we monitor close to 20 million different comments and also look at some of the big trends. Some of the trends that you're going to see in our products uh, we have made significant improvements in audio uh, and camera. These are, again, iterative improvements, uh, but also increased battery life. Uh, we have seen significant improvement in displays, 16 by 10 displays, low blue light uh, emissions, uh, low, low blue light in general. A lot of our customers are their own IT these days, and so they have to be able to maintain and protect their own systems. And then the last one is connectivity. Uh, you have no idea how many times I've had my uh, calls and I've had to go to my son and say, hey, lay off that Xbox. In fact, I just did that right now and said, hey, don't get on that Xbox right now for the next 30 minutes. I'm going to be on a call with Engadget. So you'll see these trends uh, come through. But what I love about CES is, you know, we can bring in new ideas, new concepts, get feedback. It was exactly 10 years ago or 11 years ago where we brought in the yoga convertible for the first time, right? And today, mm -hmm. convertibles are doing really well. Some of the new products that we're bringing in, as an example, uh, we're obviously bringing in a whole new line of uh, ThinkPad products. We have, we're launching the uh, uh, 5G is becoming big, and that's what you're going to see in the future. Connectivity is so important. Uh, how it, it, With everybody working from home, it is so important that if your Wi-Fi gets cut off, if you've got family members using it, 5G becomes important. So we, we're launching a number of products, including exciting new form factors like the Think Reality A3 headset, right, which is an enterprise uh, grade um, uh, form factor where it allows you to basically uh, have a virtual display of five different displays, 1080p, where you can basically have five different screens, or you can have remote uh, work capability, right? Or even devices like the Lavi, uh, the Mini Lavi, which is basically an eight-inch convert eight convertible, and it, it can transform into your gaming device, right? And you can basically project it on a big HDMI screen by docking it. So I love the show. We're, we're really excited about some of the uh, products that we're launching. I mean, last CES, I believe it was the first time Lenovo even showed off your prototype foldable tablet PC. Uh, Lenovo certainly isn't one to, to shy away from being a little more experimental there. Uh, you also did really early on introduce a yoga book. I believe the, one of the first dual screen uh, laptop tablet hybrids there are. So again, I, I think people watching the stream know how, you know, how much Lenovo has been trying out in the space of PCs. But my question for both of you on the panel today, and I'll start with you, Dilip, because we're going to take turns with who answers questions first, okay? So, Dilip, answer me this. How do you decide what it is you think consumers want? Or, you know, a lot of people think maybe companies just throw ideas on a wall and see what sticks, right? And I'm sure there's more of a science to it than that. What is the process of coming up with something creative, like the foldable or a yoga hinge, for example? What does that look like for Lenovo? Sure. Um, so great question, Sherilyn. I get this question a lot, right? At <laughs> Lenovo, you know, one of the things is we are constantly listening to customers. I was mentioning, you know, we have, uh, you know, data analytics team that's basically mm -hmm. processing close to 20 million comments on the internet. And I can have sentiment analysis on every product. 
uh, if, if what, what did they like, what did they dislike, and then every product manager is taking that uh, input and feedback and improve, improving the product generation to generation, and we've seen that. We get customer NPS scores on what they like in terms of their satisfaction, in terms of their uh, effort, in terms of their, uh, you know, would they recommend the product. So we're doing millions of surveys. We're processing close to 20 million comments. We're also doing ethnographic study. In fact, our Legion lineup of gaming devices actually came from observing uh, people and observing that people want a device that is powerful on the inside, but looks professional on the inside. So by doing an ethnographic study and actually going into people's houses, what kind of games do they play? What is their desktop environment <laughs> look like? So all those factors go in to uh, discovering, but then also you look at the technology trends out there, right? Display is a great example. Last year, as you saw, we launched the X1 foldable. If the display industry weren't ready, we wouldn't be there. So it took, multiple iterations over four years to get the X1 foldable out. So you look at technology trends uh, that's coming out of the marketplace. 5G is another one. You're going to see a lot more 5G. In fact, our new uh, X1 Titanium uh, that we're launching uh, and our X1 Carbon, X1 Yoga, they're all 5G ready right, uh, uh, to available. So it's a combination of looking at what customers are telling us insights, focus groups, uh, talking to both consumers, enterprise customers, but then also looking at a combination of technology trends uh, in the marketplace. I'll get back to that a little later. Mike, what about you? How does, H how does HP make some of these decisions? I think the foundational stuff that Lee mentioned is, is exactly right. We're very big users of Net Promoter Score. I think the key thing for us that's emerging is the amount of telemetry we're getting in a way that's obviously respectful of customer privacy. And, and really triangulating you know, the emotion of a net promoter score response, how likely might I recommend with some of the telemetry about what's really going on on the device to try to derive insights, both for improving the quality of the experience, but also to make sure we're addressing the aspirational needs. I think the ethnographic studies are, are critical as, 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 as they are for Lenovo, but for us, we sort of go a step beyond that to try to really go look at what I'll call design thinking understand not just based on the technology speeds and feeds, but really thinking about the aspirational experiences, the problems to be solved by the customer. And then Frank will go back and build what oftentimes become, what I'll call sort of low fidelity prototypes in hardware and software, to understand will these kinds of solutions make sense for the customer and then bring them out sort of more from a product perspective. I think another big thing we focused on over the last few years is really in addition to looking at technology trends, which obviously we're very, very close to, also looking at design and fashion trends. So the colors that we choose, those palettes, the fact that your HP laptop looks like a new Italian purse, that's not a coincidence. It's because we're going to those same design experiences and those same design shows to understand where those trends are going and then embracing those as part of our product design. I will say I do love the way that HP laptops look in general. The Spectra line is one of the best looking uh, I've seen. Uh, but, but you know, you brought up, by the way, the, the Levy Mini. Now, this is one of the most surprising products for me so far of the show anyway. And I think our viewers are pretty taken by it. In fact, uh, in our live chat right now, one of our regular viewers, Mark Dell, wanted to know how the idea for the Levy Mini came about. It is such a... It's not that, you know, no one has tried a concept like this before, but the Levy, again, to remind the viewer, this is a sort of an eight-inch netbook-ish uh, notebook with modern components. And then you can flip it around as a convertible and then add, like, little controllers to the size to turn it into sort of like a giant switch. Uh, Dilip, what sort of, what, what was the customer feedback that led you down this road? Yeah, I mean, if you think uh, this product was actually developed by our NECPC division in Japan. And if you know anything about Japan, everything has got to be miniaturized. Everything has got to be uh, the ability to on go. So I think when talking to customers, the feedback definitely is, look, we want a full-blown PC. But gaming we've seen is huge, right? So what if we could combine a device that could be a full-blown PC? It's an 8-inch convertible with gaming controllers uh, also and the ability to dock at the same time. So again, that's what really led to this. Again, it's a prototype, right? And we're looking for to get some feedback 
uh, from customers. And we have a reputation of taking risks and innovating in this space, whether it's the yoga book or whether it's the X1 foldable, right? We're going to try different things and get feedback from customer. And if we get positive feedback, we'll launch this product. So, um, I mean, I'm personally a little bit skeptical about the typing experience on an eight inch device like this, but granted it is still a concept, a prototype, like you said. Now you mentioned that you're still taking customer feedback. Is there any way for both of you, HP and Lenovo, by the way, any way for say our viewers right now to get in touch? Is, is, is there a forum? Is there a, a hotline that they can call maybe? Uh, uh, Mike, let's start with you. Yeah, I think we have many, many forums on HP.com and I encourage customers to give us feedback. Honestly, one of the things we've also focused on, especially for um, consumer customers, is right on the device is the ability to you know, frequently get a request for a NPS survey. And I'll tell mm -hmm. you that there are so many great ideas that you know, we think we can think of everything, we certainly can't. And so many customer inspired <laughs> ideas come in through that channel that's sort of you know available and a thing we look at, I personally look at that data all the time and the, the notion that we get it in almost a real time nature um, is, is super critical and the forums are just a great place for that feedback. What about you, Cliff? Yeah. How, does, how can people get in touch with Lenovo? And, and, and same thing, Sherilyn, when you go to Lenovo.com forums, uh, there will be a forum on, the, uh, on this particular product and the great opportunity to give that feedback. And I can tell you, every product manager at Lenovo is looking at the comments on uh, on our products. You know, what do they like? What do they dislike? And you will see that generation to generation. I still remember four generations ago on our X1 Carbon, uh, a lot of people are complaining about the audio quality speakers for generation. And today yeah. we've deployed front facing uh, speakers purely based on customer feedback. Displays is another one three or four years ago. In fact, the number one thing that we know that people talk about uh, on our forums you'd be surprised, is displays. And that's why we've significantly taken that every little bit of feedback and improved the brightness, improved the resolution, improving the color gamut, going to 16 by 10, going edge to edge. Uh, that's what customers are looking for and that's what we do. So yeah, definitely come on the forums, give us that feedback. And I can tell you, uh, we're definitely reviewing each and every piece of comment. It's certainly interesting you mentioned that displays have indeed, uh, in my experience, improved over the last few years on laptops. The audio improvement uh, seems a little slower, but I'm sure this is something that you both are aware of and are working on. I've seen some of your later, latest products that pay attention to those things. Uh, I did want to make sure we talk about just laptops more broadly also, right? Yeah. And you mentioned all these ideas that are coming up from your customers are so wild and so interesting. But what are the limits? What are what are you constrained by that that you know you still have to bear in mind, uh, Dilip? What what would you say is a, a physical challenge in in building something wild? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you know, your, your CPUs, your performance, your storage, right? I mean, we've seen uh, a significant improvements in the motherboards. I mean, they are miniaturized significantly. The keyboard is, again, you know, if you want a normal typing experience, there's only so mm -hmm. much, as you, as you yourself said, on the Lovey, it's an eight inch. Yes, yeah, so the keyboard <laughs> typing experience, it, you know, it's not gonna be optimal on a, versus a regular 14 inch uh, type of form factor. But I can also tell you that when we have uh, done surveys with Gen Zs and we have talked to them, they're very open to different ideas. And, and in fact, we've shown them foldables, we've shown them convertibles, we've shown them detachables, and there is no winner uh, in this marketplace. So customers are very, especially the Gen Z and consumer, they're very open to different ideas. But I would say probably the keyboard's the, probably the biggest thing in general that I would say that kind of defines your uh, PC experience. But like I said, and we've tried that with the foldable, and you've seen what we do with the foldable. So I see foldables to be much more uh, a growing category in the near future. Mike, what about you? What are some limits that, or, or maybe there aren't any limits, but what are some limits that govern kind of HP's uh, more creative pursuits? Yeah, I, I think it's it's very much a balance, Sherilyn, where you want to balance both performance, battery life, and in some level, you know, thermals and the, and, and the size of the device and weight, of course. So I think you know, in some cases, we've seen some of our competitors sometimes making a device be super thin in order to do that, having to throttle back the performance of the device. And especially for emerging workloads like creators, customers tell us they'd rather have the device maybe sometimes be a millimeter thicker if they can get that much better video rendering performance. We really 
focused on those kinds of capabilities. I'll also say that you know, we're also learning a lot more, especially as people are working in these new, you know, work from home or hybrid workforce workplaces, which really add up to working more hours. We all know that. I think one of the okay. things we've been investing in a lot recently is blue light filtering, something called IE's technology that we're building in in hardware. And the benefit is you get the benefit of being able to look at the screen for a long time without being affected by blue light, but still have your color accuracy be, be appropriate. So whites look white, even though blue light's being filtered. So Mike, this question is specifically for you because Lenovo's already got a foldable tablet out there, but what is HP's you know, take on foldable displays uh, in its products at all? I think we're, we're definitely looking at that. I think we've sort of seen you know, the, the market emerging in terms of where the, the screens themselves and that technology being reliable. We wanna make sure we're giving customers a product with great longevity. And frankly, also working very closely with our OS partners, Microsoft in particular, to make sure we've got software that can support those experiences. Oh, for sure. I think that's one of the challenges that I think we haven't really discussed yet. It's that like a lot of the limits tend to come from software. Often the hardware is great, but the software holds it back. And that's one of the biggest complaints from our end uh, thus far. I, I want to now zoom out even more. And since both of you are such experts in this space, I want to know what you think. So let's start with you, Dylan. What do you think, let's say in, in two years or in five years even, what will a laptop look like? What are the things that has uh, you know, what are these must have features and then what are some of the wilder features we can expect? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think overall what you're going to see in a, uh, whether it's in the next two years or within the next five years, uh, we have seen tremendous growth in the in the PC market. You just saw the numbers from IDC. Uh, in, you know, we haven't hit these numbers since 2015. So we're at close to 300 million PCs uh, in 2020. Mm -hmm. The growth rate of roughly what about 13, uh, 14 percent uh, in the marketplace. So uh, I'm bullish in terms of there's a huge market uh, that you know a lot of a lot of an installed base that has older PCs that will need to buy upgraded or newer PCs. Obviously, from an iterative standpoint, you're going to continue to see significant improvements in in audio, uh, in cameras overall. Uh, I mean, something as simple as, you know, we're instituting Dolby Voice. So we're all working remotely. And with Dolby Voice, you can actually feel as if you're like in a conference room, right? And yeah. being able to uh, hear what other people are saying, it's able to suppress some background noises, uh, accentuate softer noises. It's the little things uh, from an innovation standpoint that'll make a big difference in terms of remote work, right? Technology obviously needs to help us stay connected, but also from our well-being perspective. Uh, you heard Mike Nash also talk about our displays. Everybody's focused on reducing blue light displays, you know, going to edge to edge. Uh, battery life is going to get improved. Our IdeaPad uh, 5G, you're already at 20 hours. And again, that is as we hopefully get out of COVID uh, situation, <laughs> as we're able to get out there, right? We need battery life. We need full day's battery life. So you're starting to see battery life getting full day, uh, you know, getting uh, IdeaPad 5G, we're getting 20 hours. And my hope mm -hmm. is that that'll be the standard going forward, 10, 15, 20 hours uh, overall. These devices are going to be self-healing uh, in the future, as as we found out this year, there is no IT support now, right? Everybody's working remotely, so you have to be your own technician. You have to be your own remote devices. So you'll start to see these devices becoming self-healing, right? And being able to predict when things are go going to happen. We're providing diagnostics to large enterprise customers and being able to predict when some of these some of these drivers are potentially going to fail, right? With our self-diagnostic capabilities, connectivity is huge. Uh, I envision in a couple of years, 5G will be pretty much standard, right? Available on all the laptops. So you're no longer, uh, you know, throttled by Wi-Fi everywhere, right? So it's connectivity uh, anywhere and everywhere. What about you, Mike? What do you think uh, on that yeah, topic? I, think I know, I know, Dylan's covered a lot. <laughs> I think honestly, for me, it's not just the technology for the sake of technology, but really where the trends are going with the customers that we're going after. I think in particular, this whole notion of a hybrid workforce, it's a very real thing. I think you know we, we know that you know today about half the global workforce is working remote. But I think even mm -hmm. things as things go back to steady state, I think you know seventy percent of knowledge workers you know are going to want a hybrid remote office model. 
And really the, the notion of micro mobility becomes a really big deal where I may be working in different parts of my home. I may need to have great battery life even within the home. We're also very focused on helping to make sure that as customers have a notebook, they can dock. And we're excited about you know our embracing of USB-C for power delivery, for video, and for docking of peripherals. I think as we move forward, um, making sure we're making it easier for companies to deploy and manage the full customer lifecycle is critical. But as you think about the laptop of the future, certainly the fundamentals of keyboard and touchpads are critical. I wonder mm -hmm. though, if there'll be more scenarios where you're not always doing input via keyboard and not always getting information back via the screen and therefore mm -hmm. different, what I'll call next generation user interfaces become a critical part of the roadmap. Yeah, and Charlotte, to, Charlotte, to build on uh, Mike's point, uh, voice is going to be huge, right? Um, and we've seen that. We've uh, deployed the Alexa show mode in a number of our consumer PCs. So it's just like talking to any Alexa uh, smart device, right? So we've instituted that capability. So voice is certainly going to be huge. That's that's a really good point you bring up. Um, I, I It does sound, though, like a lot of these things are not you know, very obvious to the eye immediately. These are, you know, the general shape of laptops, besides what Mike has pointed out about if we move away from keyboard and uh, trackpad inputs, the general shapes of laptops don't seem to be changing all that much. I mean, besides uh, occasional like hexagonal shapes with the cutouts for the USB-C, shouting out to UHP. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, do, do you think then we're more or less settled in terms of form factor? We've, we've seen the sort of move from clamshell to convertible. We're starting to see some foldable uh, traction, just shapes, right, of laptops. We think they're gonna stay for the next few years. Uh, let's start with you, Mike. I mean, I think in particular, I've been really excited about, as you mentioned, Sherlyn, the, the, the previous Spectre folio, now the Elite the elite folio, because I think, again, it's the key postures it supports. I love the 360, don't get me wrong, I've carried one for years, but the idea of having the clamshell mode and the and the, and the consume mode and the tablet and the, and the, the, uh, the pen mode to me yeah. are super, super critical in terms of customer feedback. I mean, foldables, we've looked at them, they're interesting, but in terms mm -hmm. of where customer attention happens, especially I think we've looked at, you know, kind of as customers have struggled with iPad Pros, you know, they, they're trying <laughs> to be a clamshell, but really when it's in the magic keyboard, can you use your pen very easily? Can you watch mm -hmm. Netflix in a way that's convenient? We tried to make sure that without, you know, pulling the tablet off, you have the ability to go in those three postures and get what you want to do. And by the way, while storing and, and protecting your pen. Jalen, what do you think about the shape of laptops in general? So, so one thing uh, I will say is uh, I truly believe computing is everywhere. I mean, I know we're so focused on laptops, but think about it, right? A couple of years ago, we didn't have these smart devices. We weren't using voice. We have these smart frames now. We have these smart devices. We have these smart displays. So honestly, you've got your computing anywhere. In my house, you, every room has some sort of smart device where you can talk to, get to get to know your schedule. Your car has a lot of this technology already, right? You're talking to your cars today. So to me, computing is just gonna be everywhere, right? But specifically in terms of uh, laptops, I still feel we're in the very early stages of innovation. I mean, if you look at the car industry, right, how long has it been? There is no one size fits all, right? Today, people like SUVs, they like their trucks, they like their electric cars, they like their uh, convertibles, right? And you're gonna see the same level of innovation come in the PCs. And just as I mentioned, the survey that we recently did with Gen Z's recently, right? Uh, this is 24% of our buying power today, right, with Gen Z's. And when we go do surveys with them, there, there is no one size fits all. They like different form factors. There's a lot of interest in convertibles versus just standard clamshells versus, uh, you know, uh, detachables or foldables. So you know, you're going to continue to see this innovation come through uh, in, in this industry. Um, and we are about out of time, but I wanted to do a quick shout out to the live chat. The original DJ Johnny Digital mentioned that in the future, all laptops should be round. We don't know that. It doesn't seem like that is the big takeaway from today's panel. It does seem though that we have some, we have learned a little bit more about how both of your companies uh, solicit or look for user feedback and that that's a huge component of how you go on and create these, you know, creative, 
projects or, or, or products and bring them to life, which is really good to know. And then it sounds like technologies that or, or changes that we're going to see coming to laptops in the future, at least in the PC world, are mostly things that we can't see, like AI-based noise reduction. Seems like both of you are very bullish on 5G and different form factors, like the Elite Folio and foldables on the uh, ThinkPad X1 Fold front. So. I mean, I feel like I've learned a bunch from this conversation. Uh, thank you both for being here with us today. Mike, uh, it's nice to see you. And Dilip, you too. Thank you for joining us, both of you. <laughs> Hope Thanks you have for a good having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And for the, for the viewer at home, if you're tuning in live, we, in just about a minute, we are going to go over to the Sony press conference. So keep it locked here on Engadget.com or on the Engadget YouTube channel and come back tomorrow for more.